welcome to FDA's 73rd meeting of the Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee meeting. I am Mike Kaczynski, along with uh, my BFO, Christina Vert, and today's chair, which is Lisa, uh, Dr. Lisa Butterfield, uh, will be managing today's meetings. Please note that, again, this is day two of uh, this series. Uh, we will uh, We are a live public meeting, so... Please note, if we do run into any technical issues, just like many of you have, we may take a momentary pause just to address that so that you, the uh, viewers, do not miss any of the content. So with that being said, I am going to hand it off to our chair, Dr. Lisa Butterfield. Dr. Butterfield, are you ready? Yes, I am, Michael. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Butterfield. Welcome to day two of our discussion uh, about xenotransplantation. So I'd like to welcome all the members, the temporary members, all the participants, and the public uh, who are uh, viewing us remotely today. Um, a bit of housekeeping. I'm going to remind everyone uh, that I will be watching for those raised hands, and that's how we will know to call on you. We're looking forward to another very robust day of discussion on this important topic. So uh, to get things started, I'd like to turn things over to our designated federal officer, uh, Christina Vert. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. Good morning, everyone. This is Christina Burt, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer, DFO, for today's 73rd Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the committee, I am happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to continue to discuss regulatory expectations for xenotransplantation products. The committee will continue session two to discuss and make recommendations on animal organ and cells for transplantation into human subjects and their associated risks. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on May 31st, 2022. I would now like to introduce and acknowledge the excellent contributions of the staff in the Division of Scientific Advisors and Consultants, including our director, Dr. Prabha Atreya, who is my backup and co-DFO for this meeting. Other staff are Ms. Joanne Lipkine, Ms. Tonica Burke, Ms. LaShawn Marks, Dr. Susan Paydar, and Ms. Karen Thomas. And they provide excellent support for this meeting. I would also like to thank Mike Kaczynski in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working hard behind the scenes trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of Media Affairs at fdaoma at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptions for today's meeting is uh, Ms. Ora Giles. <clears throat> We will begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and temporary members. When it's your turn, please make sure your video camera is on and you're unmuted. Then state your first and last name, your organization, expertise or role, and when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please see the member roster slides in which we'll begin with the chair, Dr. Butterfield. Thank you, Christine. I'm Lisa Butterfield. I'm the uh, Vice President of Research and Development at the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy and an adjunct professor of microbiology and immunology at University of California, San Francisco. My expertise is in cancer vaccination, immune biomarkers, and cell therapies. Thank you. Dr. Assan. Hi, I'm Tavi Assan. I'm Vice, Vice President of Cell and Gene Therapy at City of Hope. I'm a bioengineer by training. I have a long history in tissue engineering, stem cells, regenerative medicine, and last few years in immunotherapy. Thank you. Dr. Bloom. Hi. My name's Marshall Bloom. I'm the Associate Director for Scientific Management at the Rocky Mountain Laboratories 
of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases located in western Montana, in Hamilton, Montana, the place where Yellowstone is being filmed. And uh, I'm an expert in virology and viral diseases. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Fox. Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Bernard Fox. I'm the Harder Family Chair for Cancer Research at the Early Childhood Research Institute. I'm a member and chief of the Laboratory of Molecular and Tumor Immunology. And that's at Providence Bolton Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Um, my area of expertise is in, in cancer immunotherapy, tumor models, uh, cancer vaccines, adoptive immunotherapy. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Uh, good morning. I'm Jeanette Lee. I'm a professor of biostatistics and a member of the Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Morrison. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sean Morrison. I direct Children's Research Institute at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and my expertise is in stem cells and cancer. Thank you. Dr. Wu. Good morning. Uh, I'm Joe Wu. I'm a cardiologist. I am the professor and director of Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. My expertise is in cardiac efficient engineering, stem cells, and gene therapy. Thank you. Dr. Auchincloss. Good morning. My name is Hugh Auchincloss. I'm the deputy director at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and my expertise is in the immune response to Zeta transplants. Thank you. Dr. Basavaraju. Hi, I'm Sridhar Basavaraju, Director of the CDC Office of Blood Organ and Other Tissue Safety. Thank you. Mr. Conway. Uh, my name is Paul Conway. I serve as the Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients. I've been a kidney patient for 42 years. I spent three years on the organ donor waiting list while I did dialysis, and I've had a kidney transplant. For 25 years, I work in federal policy and regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cooper. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matthew Cooper. I'm a clinical transplant surgeon, a director of kidney and pancreas transplantation at the MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute. I'm also the uh, current president for the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network and the United Network for Organ Sharing. Thank you. Dr. Crombez. Good morning. I'm Eric Crombez. I'm Chief Medical Officer of Gene Therapy and Inborn Errors of Metabolism and Ultragenics, and I'll be serving as an industry representative at today's meeting. Thank you. Dr. Fishman. Good morning. I'm Jay Fishman. I'm Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, um, Director of the Transplant Infectious Disease Program at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Associate Director of the MGH Transplant Center, and my expertise is in infections of the immunocompromised host and infections associated with xenotransplantation. Thank you. Dr. Kimmel. Hi. Um, I'm Paul Kimmel. I'm a senior advisor at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. I'm a clinical professor emeritus at George Washington University. My expertise is clinical nephrology. Thank you. Dr. Maraj. Good morning. I'm Samantha Maraj. I am a human geneticist and molecular biologist at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology. And there I lead the biomarker and genomic sciences group as well as the genome editing program. And my expertise is in bioassays, particularly nucleic acid measurements and genome editing. Thank you. Kathleen O'Sullivan Fortin. Hi, good morning. I'm Kathleen Sullivan Porton. Um, I'm the consumer representative uh, for this meeting. I'm a co founder and general counsel of ALD Connect, and uh, my expertise is in our rare disease advocacy and as a rare disease patient. Thank you. Dr. Polevsky. Dr. Polevsky. Paul Polevsky. Hi, I'm Paul Polevsky. I'm professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. 
I'm chief of the kidney medicine section at the VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System and deputy national program director for the VA's um, kidney medicine program. I'm a clinical nephrologist and um, I'm currently president of the National Kidney Foundation. Thank you. Dr. Zeiss. Uh, hi, I'm Caroline Zeiss. I'm a professor of comparative medicine at Yale University. I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian and an anatomic pathologist, and my research expertise is in translational animal models. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your introductions. I would also like to acknowledge CBER leadership, including Dr. Marks and Dr. Bryan, who may be present now or joining the meeting later today at other times. I will now proceed with the reading of the conflict of interest statement for the public record. Thank you. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is convening virtually today, June 30th, 2022, for the 73rd meeting of the Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, BACA of 1972. Dr. Lisa Butterfield is serving as the chair for today's meeting. The CTGT AC committee will meet in open session today to discuss the current regulatory expectations for xenotransplantation products. The committee will continue session two to discuss and make recommendations on animal organ and cells for transplantation into human subjects and their associated risks. The topic is determined to be a particular matter of general ap applicability. With the exception of the industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting and temporary non-voting members of CCGTAC are appointed as special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws include, but are not limited to, 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE, and SDE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investment, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, creatives, teaching, speaking, writing, patents, and royalties, and primary employment. And these may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest law. Under 18 U.S. Code Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee service outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interest involved or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, no conflict of interest waivers issued under 18 U.S. Code Section 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members. Dr. Hugh Wachinklotz, Dr. Sridhar Batsavarju, Dr. Matthew Cooper, Dr. Jay Fishman, Dr. Paul Kimmel, Dr. Samantha Morag, Dr. Paul Kolevsky, and Dr. Caroline Weiss. We have one patient representative, namely Mr. Paul Conway, serving as a temporary voting member. Ms. Kathleen O'Sullivan Fortin is serving as the temporary consumer representative for this committee meeting. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. 
they are voting members of the committee. Dr. Eric Crombus of Ultragenics Gene Therapy will serve as the alternate temporary industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve only as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all related industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Industry representatives on this committee are not screened, do not participate in any closed sessions if held, and do not have voting privileges. The guest speakers for this meeting are the following today. Uh, Dr. Christy Helke, Director of the Medical University of South Carolina Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. Dr. Richard Pearson III, Scientific Director, Center for Transplant Sciences, Massachusetts General Hospital. And Dr. Eckert Wolf, Professor at the Gene Center and Department of Biochemistry at the University of Munich <coughs> in Germany. Disclosure of conflict of interest for speakers and guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda, for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from the discussion, and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of the conflict of interest statement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting to Dr. Lisa Butterfield. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much, Christina. All right, well, um, now we move to uh, question four over our two-day meeting. And to start things off, we have a presentation from Dr. Pearson um, from Mass General on organ rejection. Dr. Pearson, please. Good morning, and thank you for the privilege of the floor. Uh, my uh, conflicts of interest are listed at the bottom of the slide. Uh, my task today uh, as assigned is to review immunosuppression as it's been studied in preclinical transplant models and to discuss also the potential for uh, tolerance induction as a, as a uh, valid approach to accomplishing safe and successful xenotransplantation. Uh, based on the, the wonderful presentations yesterday, it will be no secret to the uh, people on this uh, presentation the, that the uh, reason that we're pursuing xenotransplantation is that it offers the prospect of solving the uh, critical shortage of suitable organs, human organs, for available for transplantation. Our goal is to uh, provide healthy, genetically engineered pigs uh, that will allow us to safely uh, uh, provide life-supporting treatments for patients with end-stage organ disease. The, pig, the advantage of this approach is that we can define the quality of that graft ahead of the transplant. Uh, the organ can be obtained in the absence of the uh, deleterious consequences associated with brain death in uh, in human subjects, uh, in human donors, uh, and uh, with avoiding human diseases, uh, human infectious diseases in particular, uh, by sourcing animals from SPF-specific pathogen-free facilities, you can we can minimize the risk of infectious complications. This was discussed at length yesterday, and will obviously be an important uh, sub discussion for the uh, committee. Uh, pigs were chosen among potential donor species because of their short gestational period, rapid growth to uh, adult human size, and uh, multiparous uh, characteristics. Uh, because of these features, once we've identified pigs with suitable genetics for, uh, as organ donors for humans, the supply is potentially unlimited, uh, and those organs can, their organs can then be available when needed. Uh, the uh, ability to know when the transplant is going to occur facilitates conditioning of the donor and the recipient so as to optimize results, uh, potentially allowing us to reduce the immunosuppressive burden and uh, eventually, we hope, uh, to induce tolerance as a strategy for uh, optimizing results with minimal long-term consequences for our recipients. 
What are the risks? These were well reviewed yesterday uh, by Dr. Fishman, Dr. Denner, uh, and the other speakers. Uh, that was a great conversation. Uh, and I won't dwell, therefore, on the contents of this slide. Uh, the other uh, potential risk that I would put forward is the need for us to pay attention to equitable access to this potential life-saving therapy, both in the phase where we're still conducting research to optimize outcomes and also then once it's successful to be sure that both the supply can meet the demand and that financial resources and other societal constraints uh, do not limit access to this potentially life-saving therapy. I would like to review some of the recent progress in xenotransplantation. My talk will by necessity overlap somewhat with Dr. Wolf's uh, designated subject, which was to review the uh, various genetic engineering uh, uh, advances that have uh, modifications that have been introduced uh, that have uh, been associated with such significant progress in the preclinical model. Uh, and I apologize for, for that overlap, but by necessity to talk about uh, immunosuppression and what we've learned in that context, uh, there is an intersection with the effects of genetic modifications. And so, as I say, I apologize for that overlap, but I hope I will be able to clearly uh, articulate what we have learned about the particular characteristics of xenotransplantation with respect to the important role of co-stimulation pathway blockade in particular. Finally, uh, on a heart-specific point, there are, there's evidence that ischemia immunization is a critical feature, at least for the heart. Uh, this may be generalizable to other organs as well, but that remains to be determined. And I won't dwell further on the infectious disease aspects, but those, of course, are quite important. Our efforts over the past 20 years, 25 years in, uh, in working on the pig to human xenotransplant opportunity have been very much focused on understanding the mechanisms that lead to the injury of a, an organ xenograft when it's exposed to human blood. Uh, that starts uh, with the ant preformed antibodies present in almost all humans that recognize particularly carbohydrate antigens on the surface of the pig's endothelial cells. Uh, that triggers complement uh, binding as well as cell-mediated uh, injury mechanisms, uh, which uh, both of which are important to uh, triggering initial injury of the graft within minutes or hours. In addition, uh, both as a consequence of antibody-mediated endothelial activation and complement triggered injury to the endothelium, clotting cascades are activated, which lead to the clinical phenotype of graft infarction uh, and thrombus within the blood vessels, uh, as uh, well as endothelial activation uh, and leakage of uh, plasma and then whole blood into the uh, tissue of the, of the graft. Finally, one of the earliest pathways identified uh, in xenotransplant injury were, were, uh, relates to the absence of self-recognition receptors with a critical role for NK cells and uh, monocyte macrophage populations in, uh, in being activated in the absence of self-recognition signals uh, related to HLAE and CD47 as examples listed here. So over the course of the past 20 years, <clears throat> we have focused first on the preformed antibody and complement uh, by uh, either adsorbing the antibody by administering complement inhibitors. Uh, and what we learned in that context is that even when we did those things, we were still seeing graft injury delayed uh, as in phenotype, but still uh, with graft injury uh, occurring quite quickly. And so uh, what, with the advances in genetic engineering, fast forward 15, 20 years, We've learned to knock out first one and then multiple of the carbohydrate-related uh, genes, the uh, gal one 3 galactosyl transferase, uh, the CMAH uh, knockout, which relates to the new 5GC antigen, and the beta-4-gal gene, which relates to the SDA antigen. Uh, with one or more of these, uh, with the gal being the most important, uh, with one or more of these genes knocked out, we reduce the importance, in fact, eliminate the importance of the preformed anti-carbohydrate antibodies, uh, and uh, as I will illustrate in the next slides, that is associated with substantial improvement in graft behavior and survival in our preclinical transplant models. There are, in many humans, still antibodies observed that cross-react 
uh, with uh, tri even triple knockout pig endothelial cells. Uh, for that reason, uh, we have, in addition to uh, uh, the carbohydrate knockout genes, introduced human complement regulatory genes, which particularly when expressed at high levels are quite efficient to downregulate the uh, complement activation cascade and offer confer by themselves substantial protection and in the context of the carbohydrate uh, gene knockouts, uh, substantial additional protection, uh, not only to preformed antibody, but potentially also to elicited antibody in case the uh, immune suppression administered is in, uh, insufficient or ineffective. Finally, we, uh, and so let me show, illustrate now uh, the progress that's been made over the past several years and begin to uh, come to the subject of my talk, which is uh, the role of various immunosuppressive regimens to modulate the immune response to an organ xenograft. I'm using here primarily the example of hearts because that's where the data is most robust and easily compared across different regimens. The dotted line, the lowest in the legend, it refers to wild-type pigs. And you can see that it, it, when we transplant a pig heart into a uh, cinemologous monkey or a baboon, most commonly baboons, and use conventional treatment, most grafts, three quarters, are dead within a week or two. And that's in spite of a variety of different approaches to either adsorb out anti-pig antibodies or to use carbohydrate blocking molecules, so, as well as complement inhibitors. So the best we could do in the hands of very competent uh, investigators uh, never got us past one month. With the addition of, with, with, with the uh, emergence of genetic engineering to add complement regulatory proteins to pigs, uh, in the setting of either conventional treatment or anti-CD154 co-stimulation pathway blockade, between 20% uh, 20, uh, 20 and 35% of animals uh, could, uh, could be prolonged beyond one month, but attrition by two months was still quite high and long-term survivors were quite exceptional. And you can see that in some of those groups, the experience was really quite extensive. You'll note the N of 90 in the uh, complement regulatory protein with conventional treatment. Uh, with the, the GAL knockout was a, a major breakthrough, uh, and you can see that in the solid line, when GAL knockout organ hearts were transplanted in the context of co-stimulation pathway blockade, 75% uh, of the grafts got out to two months, and a minority of grafts were able to be prolonged beyond three months and even as long as almost six months. So that was a substantial step forward. Uh, I would also point out that the Mayo Clinic was able, with a carbohydrate blocking molecule and human membrane cofactor protein complement regulatory molecule expression, we're able to achieve similar results based on conventional immunosuppression in a substantial series of experiments. So what was limiting in that model was what, what I just illustrated here, it primarily thrombotic microangiopathy, formation of clots within the uh, blood vessels of the graft, as well as leak of uh, plasma proteins, and as you can see here, red cells into the parenchyma of the graft. In addition, the uh, consumptive coagulopathy was observed in the recipients quite frequently with thrombocytopenia and hemorrhagic complications away from the site of the graft. That combination of, uh, of uh, phenomena was uh, not prevented when, even when we took GAL knockout organs that expressed CD46 and used the most effective, in my view, most effective immunosuppressive uh, approach, the anti-CD154 blockade, combined with uh, induction therapy, including ATG and anti-CD20. And uh, as you can see, again, a pretty substantial series of experiments, 14, uh, achieved occasional long-term survivors. But you can see with the red horizontal lines, the uh, incidence of thrombotic microangiopathy and consumptive coagulopathy limited the duration of the experiments, even in the absence of a detectable immune response to the xenograft. That problem then led us to focus on the coagulation cascade and to uh, introduce human transgenes, particularly thrombomodulin, but also endothelial protein C receptor. Uh, and I won't take your time today to go through the mechanistic basis for this, but the, the, our preclinical results in the lung model would suggest that those two together uh, provide better protection than either by itself. 
uh, where, uh, in the lung model, whereas in the heart model, the thrombomodulin seems to be quite important and effective. That's illustrated here uh, in the breakthrough work re uh, reported by Mohammed Mohyuddin from working at that point at the NIH, when the thrombomodulin was additionally expressed in the context of the GAL knockout in CD46, and using a co-stimulation pathway-based regimen with CD40 on anti-CD40 antibody, uh, and the only other immunosuppression given to these animals other than the CD40 blockade was mycophenolate mofetil and low-dose steroids. Uh, they did have an induction regimen with ATG and anti-CD20, and in that context, they were able to consistently achieve uh, graft survivals beyond 150 days. Illustrated at the top left, I'm sorry that this is small in size, but I'll zoom in on an important features of this in the next slide. In the green line, when uh, immunosuppression was down titrated at about 90 days, uh, one graft was lost at about 150 days, and the other went to about 250 days. When the reduction in immunosuppression was delayed to about 400 days or 500 days, graft, uh, uh, the grafts continued to uh, function for, for, long, for longer periods of time, uh, out to uh, 600 days and almost 1,000 days. It, zooming in, you can see the uh, IgM, uh, the uh, the IgM response on the top, and the IgG response to uh, pig donor cells. And you can see that during treatment, uh, consistently the immune response was uh, was controlled, uh, whereas when the uh, treatment was discontinued, illustrated with the horizontal dashed green line or the horizontal dashed red line. The immune response was detectable relatively shortly thereafter, and that was associated with demise of the graft. So here, this work illustrated effective control of the anti-pig immune response in the absence of any incidence, instances of thrombotic microangiopathy or consumptive coagulopathy. In, in the view of the field, this was truly a disruptive uh, and innovative and effective contribution. So what have we learned? What had we learned at that point uh, uh, regarding from, from this work regarding the uh, mechanisms of GAL knockout, human complement factor, uh, regulatory uh, heart injury? Uh, specific, the modification of carbohydrate gene knockout, uh, at least in the context of um, T and B cell depletion induction treatment at the time of, treat, uh, time of transplant, coupled with either CD40 or CD154 blocked immunosuppression, was able to efficiently prevent elicited anti-pig antibody and complement-related injury. The consumptive coagulopathy, which had previously plagued us, uh, is efficiently controlled by the additional expression of the thrombomodulin gene, at least in the context of the complement regulatory protein, and, of course, effective immunosuppression. Uh, I think Eckert will talk more about the perioperative xenograft dysfunction, but I will talk about it a little bit in the subsequent slide. I'll come back to that. So what about orthotopic heart transplants? Everything I've shown you so far is just observing whether the heart is still beating in the abdomen in a non-working mode. What about life-supporting function of a heart xenograft? The state of the art in 2017 uh, had moved very little forward from the results published in 1999 from the group in Cambridge where they used an HDAP expressing heart in a monkey used and conventional immunos in, I believe it was actually a baboon, uh, and, and conventional immunosuppression uh, and had survival of beyond one month in, with a healthy animal up until shortly uh, until uh, demise of immunologic causes. Uh, after the work, extensive work by uh, Chris McGregor uh, and then replicated by uh, Mohammed Mohuddin and Bruno Reicher working in Germany uh, at the NIH and in Germany respectively consistently found that more than half of the animals uh, transplanted with a pig heart, even with in the hands of very competent, sophisticated heart surgeons, were unable to get, uh, about 50 percent of them were unable to survive the, the surgical procedure. And survival of more than 14 days was rare associated with inflammation in the host and uh, in the recipient and, uh, and graft injury. In addition, graft hypertrophy was identified when Bruno did some experiments in the heterotopic heart model. That, those problems were, uh, were overcome in another landmark paper published from Bruno Reichert's uh, group in Munich uh, that Eckert Wolf uh, will tell you more about in the subsequent slide. But this work truly was a breakthrough, showing that with 
uh, the same basic immunosuppressive regimen that Mohammed Mohudin used, perioperative induction therapy with ATG and uh, B-cell depletion, and then either a CD40 or CD154 targeting uh, monoclonal antibody treatment that with additional MMF and steroids, tapered steroids, the, graft, uh, the grafts were uh, consistently protected from immune injury in the absence of list detectable elicited antibody. They did use anti-inflammatory treatments in addition, uh, based on work from David Cooper's group, uh, showing that IL-6, TNF, and IL-1 are elevated around the time of transplant. And with that combination of treatments, plus uh, uh, using rapamycin to retard graft growth, they were able to uh, get consistent survival to 90 days or, or 180 days, limited mainly by regulatory uh, resistance to letting them carry the animals out further. And they have since replicated that uh, in a consistent series, which has met the ISHLT's 2000 uh, recommendations for six out of 10. In fact, they got six out of eight long-term survivors and the only graphs that they lost in that series of eight consecutive experiments using a consistent regimen were two that had pig CMV uh, activation, which uh, I think was discussed yesterday and illustrates, again, the uh, great importance of excluding pig CMV from the donor in both preclinically and in clinical application. Mohammed Mahudin was able to replicate this, as David Cooper has been able to, not included on the slide, with survivors up to nine months uh, as the longest yet. In, uh, uh, and in, in the main, all of these groups have used co-stimulation pathway blockade, uh, T and B cell depletion as induction therapy, chronic treatment with mycophenolate mofetil, and uh, in some instances with mTOR inhibitor to inhibit growth of the, of the graft. Uh, importantly, in all, at least two groups, the Mohudin group and the Reichert group, have found that the ischemia minimization and ischemia minimization strategy, strategy is essential to prevent primary cardiac xenograft dysfunction. Importantly, consumptive coagulopathy and thrombotic microangiopathy, nor evidence of other, other evidence like chronic vasculopathy, have not been observed uh, when uh, gal knockout parts combined with CD1, uh, with the CD46 complement regulator and thrombomodulin, those problems have not been encountered, consistently not been encountered. And finally, the graft hypertrophy is, seems to be inhibited <coughs> with the mTOR inhibitor. I'll turn briefly now to kidney, kidney work. Uh, you can see uh, that as I illustrated for the hearts, when wild type organs illustrated by the dots, dotted line are used, it was rare to get a patient, uh, to get a uh, subject out beyond two weeks. Uh, not much better results with uh, HDAP complement regulator by itself. Uh, gal knockout did a little bit better, uh, but only 10% of the grafts got out past a month uh, with conventional immunosuppression. Importantly, when immunosuppression was switched to co uh, complement pathway regulatory uh, blockade with CD154, uh, 65 or 70 percent of the grafts got out to a month and a minority out to nearly three months. So that illustrates, I think, the, is the best illustration head-to-head -head of the uh, relative efficacy of CD154 blockade. Proteinuria was the main limiting uh, factor uh, seen in a lot of these experiments. Importantly, then, in recent work that uh, some, some of these groups, some of the groups who generated this preliminary data uh, upon which this slide is based, uh, have now extended these observations in unpublished work. Uh, uh, but it, it, suffice it to say that it appears reproducible that by uh, additionally knocking out the beta-4 gal antigen uh, or depleting CD4 T cells as opposed to both CD4 and CD8 T cells in a double uh, transgenic animal uh, or blocking CD28 or uh, it just with gal knockout CD55 and CD154 blockade, that consistent long-term graft survival in some instances out to several years can be accomplished uh, with the important caveat that these results are only achieved in animals that have low preformed titers of antibody to their donor pig. And this is uh, so some of those results are illustrated here from the Emory group. And you can see that with, uh, with uh, CD4 depletion combined with CD154 blockade, 
two out of three animals uh, uh, had long-term graft survival beyond a year, whereas if the CD8 T cells were depleted, uh, no such results were achieved. It is important uh, to note that uh, when the cross-match was, was uh, positive, survival beyond two weeks was quite unusual, despite, even with the full immunosuppressive regimen. The MGH group has not yet published their data, but suffice it to say that using a regimen which has been described in the literature uh, that is very similar to what I've just illustrated for the heart, T cell and B cell induction treatment, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, tapered steroids, and rapamycin, that they have gotten m multiple survivors out past 300 days and consistent survival, I would say, beyond 150 days. Uh, and that work uh, should be uh, being prepared for uh, publication soon. So uh, uh, briefly at the end, I'll turn to xenotransplantation uh, to, to tolerance induction. Uh, David Sachs, Megan Sykes, and Kazi Yamada have made major contributions in this area over 20 years uh, and uh, have developed a tolerance induction regimen based on mixed hematopoietic chimerism. They use inbred uh, genetically defined S swine leukocyte antigen defined pigs, which uh, have the gal knockout and CD55 uh, human transgene. Uh, they have uh, recently done work with showing that the CD47 uh, gene addition added to these pigs is protective and enables uh, improved duration of bone marrow, micro, uh, bone marrow engraftment and microchimerism. Uh, and you'll note that the regimen that they're using uh, based on CD154 uh, and immune, tapered immunosuppression is quite similar to that that I've uh, illustrated in for the heart for multiple groups. Uh, and um, even in the lung, they've been able to get survivors out to about two weeks. And the thymoglobin, I'm so sorry, there's a typo, they've gotten out to almost 200 days with uh, uh, immunomodulation that uh, transplants the pig's thymus under the kidney capsule as a code graft. And that strategy appears to be uh, very promising as, the, as a platform. So with the right pigs and with immunosuppression, such as I've described for you here, it would appear that uh, the prospects for um, uh, both successful immunosuppression and tolerance in xenotransplantation are quite good. Uh, and it would be a regimen like this that many of us feel we would uh, be uh, able to uh, make a case for going forward to the clinic. Uh, the, what I think we've demonstrated, what I hope I've convinced you of, is that co-stimulation-based uh, immunosuppression is effective to protect uh, a xenograft from immune injury, at least in the context of the gal knockout and complement regulatory protein uh, expressing pig that also express thrombomodulum. We do now have examples of a less complicated genetics, specifically gal knockout with beta-4 gal knockout or gal knockout with hum human complement regulatory protein uh, expression that at least in the context of a negative preoperative cross match, uh, is, capable, is, is associated with long-term graft survival uh, in expanding series of, uh, of in the hands of multiple investigators. Uh, and importantly, acute cellular rejection is rarely seen with this regimen, and consumptive coagulopathy and thrombotic microangiopathy in the heart or proteinuria in the kidney are uh, not seen or consistently not seen um, uh, in, in, the, in the recent experiences. Important things that we do not know are whether induction therapy is necessary for these results. Uh, also important, we don't know, uh, we haven't, it has not yet been directly studied whether calcineurin inhibitors or, micro, or conventional immunosuppression could be used to substate, substitute for co-stimulation pathway blockade in every one of these models. But where these have been compared head to head, co-stimulation pathway blockade appears to be uh, more effective than uh, calcineurin inhibitors in particular. Uh, uh, and again, the necessity for MMF and mTOR in long-term outcomes has not yet been rigorously proven, although the Germans have shown that mTOR weaning out uh, toward the end of the experiment was associated with graft hypertrophy, uh, which would imply that that is going to be necessary, at least for the heart. Uh, and I would argue that tolerance may be achievable with, um, with uh, genetic mod uh, certain genetic modifications uh, in that mixed hematopoietic chimerism model. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions now or at the end. 
Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, very interesting and, and a lot of important progress over the last few years. So thank you for summarizing that for uh, everyone on the committee. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. And so why don't we go to first Dr. Denner, uh, then Dr. Cooper. Um, uh, Dr. Denner. Thank you very much for this nice talk. And uh, my question concerns the uh, problems with coagulation. Would it be possible that in the uh, early experiments, problems with uh, coagulation may be due to an uh, unrecognized, uh, undetected infection with PCMV? That is possible. I would, uh, Jay Fishman will be able to answer this better, more accurately than I. But even in, even in instances, particularly in the kidney, where PCMV was not demonstrated, and I think he mentioned that data to some extent yesterday. Uh, the graphs were lost early if PCMV was detected, but graphs were still lost later uh, in the absence of PCMV act evidence of, detect of detectable PCMV activation. Uh, and uh, as I say, it was mainly proteinuria in the kidney experience, but I believe that was also seen in the hearts. So I think that while avoiding PCMV is clearly going to be important, I don't think it accounts for all of the coagulation pathway dysregulation that was seen. And I think that Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Mahudin's work at the NIH used pigs which were from uh, Revivacor's facility and were demonstrated to be CMV free, specifically designed because of that concern. Uh, and the co consumptive coagulopathy without human thrombomodulin was still consistently seen. So I think that it's, it can't be excluded. It's hard to prove a negative. But I do believe that this, the coagulation pathway regulation is independently uh, important. What triggers it remains an important question. Uh, but it is for the purposes of designing a clinical trial, knowing that if you have human thrombomodulin or a you know, similar coagulation pathway regulator in the genetics, offers, in my estimation, an, a, a protective advantage, uh, at least based on what we've seen so far. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, now, Dr. Cooper, uh, followed by Dr. Auchincloss. Hey, Robin. Uh, outstanding work, uh, as usual. Really pleased, um, and congratulations on your own work. I, I'm, I'm fascinated, you know, as a, a reader of this literature, and with your experience with what you presented today. Do you have a, do you have an opinion on kind of what now is the, the sweet spot in terms of the number of knockouts and transgenes that may be necessary? Sort of recognizing, you know, kind of the, um, you know, the, the cost that's necessary for each, you know, additional modification that we talk about. In, in other words. You know, a single versus triple knockout. Uh, you know, do you, again, do you have a thought about kind of where you know the minimums are at this point? So I think for a kidney into an unsensitized patient, you probably can get away with, and I'll use that term advisedly, a gal knockout with a complement regulatory protein uh, pro, uh, express, expression of the human complement regulatory protein. I think that simple genetics could go forward with reasonable justification. I think you will have an advantage by additionally knocking out the beta-4 gal and probably in humans, unlike in non-human primates, uh, knocking out the CMAH gene will additionally give you an advantage, both by greatly increasing the number of patients for whom the cross-match will be negative to begin with and thereby ex allowing a much broader swath of the population uh, of patients who might benefit to, to safely receive the graft. For the hearts, the minimum gene set appears to additionally include the human thrombomodulin, and I think that data is persuasive. If you have a triple knockout, might this problem be uh, assuaged? You might, might you avoid consumptive coagulopathy and thrombotic microangiopathy? Maybe, but the, uh, even in the examples with triple knockouts where we've avoided, where we can't detect elicited antibody, we still see uh, consumptive coagulopathy, and that's not a big N yet, but um, I'm persuaded that you need at least those three genes. And again, will it be an advantage to have the two additional carbohydrate genes knocked out in addition to gal knockout? I think it will be an advantage long term. Is it necessary to go forward? Is it necessary to achieve uh, very uh, impressive and potentially therapeutic uh, clinical results? Will depend on clinical trials. It is 
likely that long-term results will be better with triple knockout, and that, but that's just my inference based on what we've seen preclinically and uh, the mechanisms that, as we understand them. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Um, and now Dr. Auchincloss, please. Robin, that was a spectacular presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, sort of an extension of Dr. Cooper's question. As you piled on more genetic modifications, have you seen any cost in terms of the fitness of the animals or the organs? Is there a downside to this much genetic manipulation? So adding additional co complement pathway regulators has not been adversely consequential to the best of my knowledge. There is a fundamental fitness challenge with using cloned animals, and understanding the impact of adding gene edits is difficult to separate from that challenge. With coagulation pathway regulatory molecules, it is clear that if you are too good at doing that, there is an incidence of bleeding abnormalities in the animals. Can one get through that? Yes, uh, at least in some circumstances, but there is a potential adverse uh, effect on, on uh, animal health. So maybe in the ideal future, we might be able to control the thromboregulatory gene expression with inducible promoters or conditional expression, and that might offer a safer way for us to get pigs to the size where their organs are useful for humans, turn on the gene just around the time of transplant, and if it led to, if it were associated with a problem later in the recipient, being able to turn it off. But that is a not, I think, necessary for us to, uh, it, it is possible to get healthy animals with moderate levels of thromboregulatory expression, gene expression. We have very good preclinical data with those pigs, suggesting that that is enough and safe. And indeed, the animals created that have that pattern of gene expression are healthy and both uh, in the clone form and I understand also as in the breeding situation are able to be propagated safely. Uh, so that I think this is a subject for other experts who are actually working with these animals on the ground and perhaps Dr. Wolf might be able to address it in addition. Did that, did that address your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Super, thank you. Um, and now a final question uh, in this session um, from our patient uh, representative, uh, Mr. Conway. Hey, Dr. Pearson, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Imagine you were standing uh, before a room of uh, kidney patients that were on a waiting list for an organ in their families. And this is a question that I asked Dr. Denner yesterday, and he was kind enough to answer it, but I'm interested in your perspective. Uh, knowing what you know today and uh, the progress that has been made and the research that's out there and the caution and uh, the details that you've laid out. Um, do you have an optimistic sense about what the future holds for patients and for this as a modality or as a solution? Or are you uh, extremely guardedly uh, optimistic? What's your sense of it if you were just talking straight with the patients and families? Thank you. I am an I am very optimistic that the results, that good results will be easier to achieve, to achieve in our human patients than they are in our baboons or our monkeys. I think the pigs have been designed for human use, and it's fortuitous that these genetic modifications also, many of them, are effective. But the barriers in the preclinical model, uh, when we try to use triple knockout pigs, it turns out that that unveils an antigen recognized by monkeys and baboons that creates a positive cross-match where it does not in humans. So that's one example where we sort of have to take a leap of faith when we go to clinical uh, models. And if I were asked, talking to you about enrolling in a xenotransplant trial, I would explain that and tell you that my best guess is that a triple knockout with a few, with whatever additional genetic modifications is quite likely to be able to support you for a year or two or three, quite likely, I can't promise, until we try it. And uh, while the results in, in brain-dead humans uh, illustrate that hypercute rejection doesn't occur, we don't know yet whether we are with the treatments that have worked so well in the non-human primates will translate into humans. It is quite clear that, in my mind, that 
experimental immunosuppression with a with a uh, co-stimulation pathway blocking antibody will be an essential part of a of long-term success, either as an immunosuppressive regimen or for tolerance induction. But I think that what we've learned in the non-human primates has positioned us for success. And I think that if we can certify that a pig doesn't have cytomegalovirus and that other that we have strategies for managing other aspects of infectious disease or uh, that the clinical complications that we're likely to see as we do in all of our transplant recipients are likely to be more easily managed in in um, in the clinic and that I so I am quite optimistic that when we hit the go button for for doing these clinical trials that we will be pleasantly surprised by the outcome. I hope that that's true, and I can't know it until we try it. Thanks for your candor. I appreciate it. Thank you. And a final, final short question um, from Dr. Pilevsky. Thank you. I was just <clears throat> to put the immunosuppression in context. I was hoping you could compare the experimental immunosuppression that you believe is going to be necessary to the uh, current immunosuppression used for um, uh, allotransplantation? Certainly. The calcineurin inhibitors, which are the mainstay of current clinical immunosuppression, have side effects, renal damage, uh, diabetes, neuropathy, and they require being taken several times, twice a day. Uh, mycophenolate causes gastrointestinal complications and other issues. Rapamycin is uh, one of, is so difficult to tolerate that even though it's quite effective, it is not achieved broad use in transplantation. I, the the co-stimulation pathway blockade given once a week or once every two weeks is not associated with viral activation in our non-human primate models, as and so it may be that it is safer and better tolerated than or allows lower dosing of conventional immunosuppression. So I would say that our immunosuppression uh, either it will, it will be possible for us to get good protection of the graft from immune injury with less intense immunosuppression than we currently use for our, uh, for our, our patients today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that was terrific. And now we're going to move to our second and final presentation before the question discussion, um, and that's from Dr. Wolf um, from the uh, from Munich, Germany, on genetically modified pigs. Dr. Wolf. Yeah. Good morning, and many thanks for the opportunity to discuss with you source animals with intentional genomic modifications. I'm afraid I will not be able to add a lot of new information because most of the aspects have been covered in the very elegant talk by Dr. Pearson. I, so these are my disclosures. And uh, I think there is no doubt that at the moment the pig is the most likely donor or animal for xenotransplantation because the organs are very similar to human organs in terms of anatomy and also physiological aspects. We can breed pigs very well. Uh, one generation pig takes only one year. They have large litters. We can breed them under designated pathogen free conditions and ensure that uh, they uh, don't have a risk to, uh, to distribute infections. And the most important point is that we can do genetic engineering. And in this aspect, they are superior to non human primates. Where genetic engineering is not possible or very difficult, and uh, also in terms of ethical acceptance, pigs are much better. We need to do genetic engineering to overcome rejection mechanisms, also physiological incompatibilities, and eventually to reduce the risk of porcine endogenous retroviruses. And I'm sure you remember that 20 years ago, when it was discovered that porcine cells release perf that may infect human cells. This was a very difficult situation for xenotransplantation because at this stage clearly the fears dominated over the hoax into this technology. 
Well, over the last 20 years, a number of genetic modifications have been made in order to produce source pigs for xenotrophic transplantation. One group concerns the deletion of enzymes that uh, synthesize certain sugar epitopes against which we humans have uh, preformed natural antibodies. These are uh, the enzymes alpha-1, 3, galactosyl transferase, CMAH, B4, gal in and uh, recently, a uh, second enzyme, a B4 gal nt 2 like has been discovered that also has to be knocked out in order to completely remove the SDA epitopes. Another group of modifications are proteins that uh, regulate uh, the complement pathway and inhibit it. A third group uh, concerns uh, transgenes that need to overcome a coagulation disorder regulation, namely thrombomodulin, EPCR, uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor C39 and CD73. Then a number of transgene has been proposed to overcome cell mediated rejection by T cells, T cell co-stimulation blocking mo molecule, or the knockout of swine leukemia antigens, or the expression of HLAE and beta 2 microglobulin or CD47 to inhibit NK cell activity or macrophage activity, respectively. In preclinical experiments, so far mainly in mice or in combinations with other transgenes in non human primates, anti inflammatory proteins have been tested, such as A20, uh, human hemoxygenase, or as we said, the uh, soluble fragment. An important modification that ought to be necessary after, especially after heart transplantation, was the growth hormone receptor knockout. And of course, there are modifications that are related to either the knockdown or the complete knockout of perf expression. When we think about the tools that we have available for genetic engineering of pigs, the classical technique was the DNA microinjection technique, where pieces of DNA gene constructs were injected in one of the two pronuclei of zygotes. This was a very random technology where one could not determine how many copies of a transgene are integrated and where they are integrated. And nowadays, most groups rely on somatic cell nuclear transfer because then all genetic modifications can be done in cell culture. We can select cell clones that have exactly the right genetic makeup and then use one's cloning according to the Dolly technique in order to generate the corresponding pigs to these uh, targeted genetically modified cells. And with the advent of gene editing, especially the CRISPR-Cas9 system, it's now also possible to not out one or even several genes uh, in by zygote injection of these systems. Just a few comments on somatic cell nuclear transfer, and this is a very impressive study where they have looked at the outcomes of over 200,000 nuclear transfers, and what you can very see, easily see in the last column is that uh, in general the, the efficiency is very low uh, usually below 5% uh, on offspring based on the number of transferred cloned embryos to recipients. And unfortunately, there is also a large number of abnormalities. And this is probably related to the fact that nuclear transfer cloning produces a very high epigenetic variability. This has been best investigated in terms of DNA methylation, so there is a large variety in DNA methylation levels. But recently there are also studies that histone modifications are affected. And in some studies there was also a phenotypic correlate. This is one example where a group looked at the placenta of cloned piglets and in some of those placentae, they found both morphological abnormalities, but also a dysregulation of the expression of genes that are uh, essential for placentation. So I think cloning, as a, as a result of these observations, cloning is a very good technique in order to derive the genetic modified founder animals, but those animals that are actually used for transplantation uh, as donors for transplantation, they should be produced by breeding because fortunately it has been shown that one cycle 
of sexual reproduction is sufficient to erase all these epigenetic abnormalities. While coming back to the essential genetic modification, and this has already nicely been shown by Dr. Pearson, pig cells have these carbohydrate antigens on their surface against the humans and also non-human primates in part have preformed natural antibodies. The antibodies bind their targets, activate the complement system, which finally leads to a hyperacute rejection of, of the porcine cells. And this can be overcome either by knocking out these glycosyl transferases or by the expression of one or several complement pathway regulatory proteins. And basically, using a combination of these modifications, it's really possible to overcome uh, the hyperacute rejection of uh, pigs to primate xenografts. And the removal of this antigen, of course, also eliminates the antibody dependent cy cellular cytotoxicity. When we look at the human antibody binding to normal pig cells, you can clearly see that there are already a lot of antibodies in very young children, and the antibody levels increase, both IgM and also IgG. And when the three glycosyl transferases have been knocked out, basically this uh, binding is minimized. And therefore, for humans, probably the TKO pig is the best donor animal. However, there is a problem in the transplantation experiments in non-human primates because apparently the knockout of CMAH increases the binding of baboon antibodies to pig cells, and therefore it may be problematic for the preclinical studies. And uh, it has been shown uh, by David Cooper and colleagues that this can be reduced by adding additional protective transgenes, as you can see here. But for me, the question, of course, arises, do you need additional genetic modifications in order to overcome a problem that exists in the preclinical model but would not exist in humans? This was also tested in, uh, in vivo uh, in a recent uh, transplantation experiment of uh, porcine kidneys into Sinomoigus macaques. Here you can see that TKO pigs were used and they were combined with different transgenes, complement regulatory proteins, uh, but also proteins uh, regulating macrophage activity uh, or the activity of natural killer cells or PDL1, a negative co stimulating uh, molecule. And you can clearly see that the effect dependent on the level of the expression of the transgene, apparently TKOB, which was combined with a high expression level of the complement regulatory proteins, worked better, at least gave in some instances better long-term results, as when these complement regulatory proteins were low and only the other transgenes were highly expressed. This is another study that was already cited by Dr. Pearson, where a relatively simple genetic background has been used, only an alpha gal knockout combined with the expression of human CD55. And uh, kidneys of these donors were transplanted into uh, uh, rhesus monkeys with a negative cross match. And uh, when also the uh, CD4 uh, T cells were depleted, uh, then consistently a relatively long survival of up to 500 days was achieved, indicating that the long term survival of xenografts is possible with a relatively simple genetic background of the donor pack. In addition to the hyperacute rejection, there are, of course, also cellular rejection mechanisms by natural killer cells, and those can be overcome, for instance, by the expression of HLAE, beta to microglobulin, in the donor pigs because they bind the inhibitory CD94 NGK2 receptor on macrophages. And this is a study from our lab where we could clearly show that the cytotoxicity is markedly reduced on pig cells that express the HLAE and also uh, the secretion of the pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, interferon gamma uh, is significantly reduced. 
And as mentioned already by Dr. Pearson, a strategy to overcome macrophage activation is the expression of uh, human CD47 that binds serp alpha, the don't eat me receptor on human macrophages. In contrast, the porcine CD47 does not interact sufficiently with the serp alpha. But these two modifications have not been tested, at least not alone, in non-human primate transplantation experiments. So, so far, their effect and their necessity for, uh, for clinical studies is not clear. And finally, we also have to overcome uh, adaptive immune mechanisms, uh, T-cell activation that can occur directly by porcine antigen-presenting cells or indirectly by human antigen-presenting cells. A very important uh, tool is the blockade of the CD40, CD40 ligand pathway using uh, specific blocking antibodies or the CD86, uh, CD80 pathway, uh, CD28 pathway by using synthetic proteins like CTLA4 IG or the affinity optimized variant LEA29Y. There are also recent studies using the negative, the expression of negative co-stimulatory molecule PDL1, but it is not clear how big this effect actually is. And there is the idea to knock out SLAs, but this would only overcome the direct uh, T cell activation. In addition to rejection mechanisms, or I should mention here, that local expression of LEA29Ys was successful uh, to protect islet grafts when these uh, islet grafts were transplanted under the kidney capsule of mice. Uh, this is a histologic section showing uh, expression of LEA29Y in the pancreatic islets. And when such islets are transplanted into diabetic mice with a human immune system, all the mice stayed normal glycemic over the whole observation period, whereas wild-type islets were rejected. And here you see the reaction at the transplantation site. After transplantation of wild-type islets, there are barely insulin-positive uh, cells, instead a massive T-cell infiltration. In contrast, after transplantation of these LEA29Y transgenic islets, a large mass of insulin-positive cells, there is T-cell infiltration, but not in the graft itself, but only in the vicinity. And in a more recent study, we were able to show uh, that this works only on uh, also on a long term. Uh, these are mice that were uh, transplanted uh, seven months ago, and you still see uh, that there is a lot of insulin post tissue, and these mice had a completely normal glucose tolerance, and uh, this, uh, these islets are now non-human primate studies. On the other hand, we noticed that if you overexpress LEA29Y systemically in the donor pigs, it reduces the development of their immune system, and they are immunocompromised and very difficult to maintain. Another possibility is the SLA knockout, which may also cause some uh, immune defects in the donor pigs. Uh, uh, to our understanding, it's not necessary uh, if the recipients have a negative cross-match to TKO cells. It may be useful if, uh, the, uh, the, donor, if the recipients have a cross-match uh, have a cross match uh, with anti SLA antibodies, then it might be useful to knock out or knock down SLA1 or SLA2. In addition to immune rejection, we have to deal with coagulation disorders, and there are some incompatibilities between the porcine and the human blood coagulation systems. One example is the pair thrombin and thrombomodulin that is on the endothelial cells. Peter Cohen has shown that porcine thrombomodulin is able to bind human thrombin. However, the complex is relatively weak in activating protein C. And as a consequence, uh, we observe uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in the transplanted organs. And for this reason, it's necessary to equip the pigs with the human thrombomodulin. We did this with a construct 
where we place the coding sequence for the human thrombomodulin under the control of porcine thrombomodulin regulatory sequences. And at least in the heart, it gives us a very nice expression of endothelial cells are nicely decorated with the human thrombomodulin that is biologically active in terms of prolonging the clotting time. And when Mohamed Mohuidin tested organs from these pigs that had a guy knockout expressed the CD46 transgene plus the human thrombomodulin, you can see that one of these organs survived in the heterotopic abdominal transplantation model in baboons for 945 days and it stopped only to beat when the immunosuppression was completely discontinued. And in a later study, he showed that thrombomodulin was really key to this success because when we did some transplants uh, with uh, hearts that had only the gall knockout and the CD46, the survival time was markedly reduced and there were clear morphological signs of a thrombotic microangiopathy. One question is whether EPCR, the endothelial protein C receptor, is essential, additionally essential, to be humanized in order to prevent a coagulation disorder. And this is a study also from the lab of Peter Cohen, where he clearly showed that the porcine uh, endothelial protein C receptor works with the human thrombomodulin eventually a little bit less well than the human uh, endothelial protein C receptor, but these differences were not significant, and at least for the heart transplantation, we believe it's not necessary to express the porcine, uh, the human endothelial protein C receptor. Well, over time, a number of techniques have been, been developed to combine multiple of these modifications. This is an approach by my colleague Angelika Schnicke in Munich, where she simply generated large expression constructs, injected them uh, or transfected them into cells. They were randomly integrated, and using these, uh, she was able to get a quite good expression level. Another strategy is to do a targeted integration into a safe harbor locus, such as the ROSA26 locus, which worked for several transgenes and gave also a very good expression level. However, an even more clever approach is basically to integrate transgene expression vectors into the loci that need anyway to be inactivated. And this is an example from Revivicor, where they basically integrated expression cassettes for the CD46 and CD55 into the CMAH locus, and four expression cassettes uh, with thrombomodulin, EPCR, CD47, and hemoxygenase 1 into the gall locus. And this, of course, facilitates the breeding of the animals because you reduce the number of independently segregating units. And this is so far the most extensive germline genome engineering in pigs performed by Genesis. They performed the three knockouts and generate a large vector based on a modified piggyback vector where they have uh, in, in one row uh, expression cassettes for many transgenes. However, not all of these transgenes were expressed tracefully. You can clearly see that, uh, for instance, the thrombomodulin showed a reduced expression, whereas uh, the CD39 increased expression as compared to humans. In spite of new possibilities of genetic engineering of pigs, surprisingly, long-term results, consistent long-term results have been achieved with donor pigs carrying only a relatively small number of genetic modifications. For instance, here, this example uh, from Munich, where the donor pigs had only a guy knockout, a CD46 transgene, and a thrombomodulin transgene, and the hearts of those pigs were subjected to a special perfusion treatment with cold hyper-oncotic solution that prevented the hypoxic damage of the hearts before implantation, and they were then transplanted into baboons orthotopically, and consistently a survival of several months has been observed. The four experiments with the 90 days, they had to be terminated at this stage according to the experimental protocol. 
in two uh, experiments, we were allowed to run them longer, and they survived for half a year. And the main problem at this stage was that the hearts got too large for baboons. And this was already mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, the two donors for these experiments, they were positive for porcine cytomegalovirus, which markedly reduced the survival of these hearts. The basis for this success is a consistent transgene expression. And you can see here the analysis for the CD46 and for the thrombomodulin in all the hearts that were transplanted and that we analyzed by immunohistochemistry after explantation, uh, when the experiment was uh, terminated, we saw a very nice, consistent uh, transgene expression on the right side. Another important message that we learned from these experiments, and this is a very nice pa uh, paper by Dr. Denner from our consortium, is that the donor pigs must not be infected with the porcine cytomegalovirus. It reduces uh, the survival of the transplants. When he analyzed the viral load of different organs of the donor pig and of the recipient baboon, he found that in the heart, the viral load was several orders of magnitude higher than anywhere else. So apparently the main infection is in the heart. To my knowledge, it's not even clear if baboon cells or human cells can be infected with the porcine cytomegalovirus, but there is clearly a damage of the transplanted organ and there is a systemic upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the last aspect that we learned for the, from these experiments was that we have to take care of the growth of the transplanted heart because pig hearts grow very rapidly and at least for a baboon recipient, they get in a short time too large. We can control this for some time by treating the animals with Tempsirolimus, which is a rapamycin prodrug that inhibits the activation of mTOR. And for this, we can prevent the hypertrophy of the cardiomyocytes. This is a non-treated animal, uh, and this is a treated animal where you can see that the diameter of the cardiomyocytes is much uh, smaller. However, when we discontinue the treatment with rapamycin, the heart immediately starts to grow. So we had to think about the strategy, how to get these donor animals smaller, since this uh, growth phenomenon was not only observed in, in the heart, but also for the kidneys. This is an allotransplantation experiment performed by uh, Kasyamada, where he clearly showed that kidneys from land-raised pigs after transplantation into mini pigs, they continue to grow as they were still in the large pigs. As a potential strategy to reduce the growth of the animals, we propose to do the knockout of the growth hormone receptor gene. And here you can clearly see that the animals are smaller, their IGF-1 levels are markedly reduced, and also the hearts are smaller. And in the meanwhile, we have this also on the background of uh, pigs that are suitable for xenotransplantation. Mohamed Mohuidin has tested uh, the growth hormone receptor deficient hearts in uh, autotopic transplantation experiments to baboons. And you can clearly see there was a large effect, a significant effect on the prolongation of the lifespan of the animals, and also the hearts did not show any hypertrophy. However, when we look more closely to these growth hormone receptor knockout pigs, they are not completely normal. When they are young, they display a juvenile hypoglycemia. This is absolutely the same as in patients suffering from a growth hormone receptor deficiency. We see also a major metabolic disturbance of the liver, and we see that the animals get relatively obese because the lipolytic action of growth hormone is missing, so the breeding of those animals might be relatively difficult. Therefore, I believe, although we initially proposed this growth hormone receptor knockout and we did not see any abnormalities on the protein levels and the functional levels in the heart, I think it would be wise to choose a genetic background that fits for the size of human recipients. Well, and the last topic, of course, is to 
activate PERF to eliminate the risk of PERF transmission. This has been done, as you know, by George Church. Genesis, they were able to inactivate all PERF integrants by mutagenesis of the POL gene and were able from mutagenized cells basically to clone pigs. However, this is, uh, it's questionable whether this is routinely necessary because there are also some risks associated. Uh, this is only possible with some tricks, for instance, the use of a P53 inhibitor and uh, some of the cells or the majority of the cells that have been analyzed, they showed major chromosomal abnormalities. There are other ways to increase the safety in terms of PERF, which is to choose PERF C3 donor animals and eventually also um, uh, do appropriate tests um, and monitor the patients. Uh, but this is still uh, a matter of discussion. So to summarize the current state, I think the use of pigs as source of cell tissues and organs for single transplantations uh, offer unique opportunities since we can genetically engineer the donor pig a lot of many multiple modifications have been made, but only few of them have been really evaluated in non-human primates. Genome editing is, of course, speeding the progress, and the combination of genetic modifications required depends on the type of organ and tissue, and especially for cellular xenografts, also on the transplantation side. A very important point is the cellular localization and the consistency of transgene expression for the functionality and also for potential side effects. Remarkable long-term survival has been achieved with relatively few genetic modifications of the donor pigs, and therefore xenotransplantation can be considered as a future therapeutic option. Specifically, for the source pigs, we have to ask the question, are more genetic modifications always better? I think when we want to demonstrate the efficacy and safety of individual modification, this is definitely easier if there are only few. The same is true for the demonstration of long-term stability and expression of each modification. The cellular localization is important. Transgene expression is difficult to modif modulate once a transgene is already active in, in the transplant, whereas drug treatments can be dose adjusted or even discontinued. With an increasing number of genetically modified loci, the breeding strategy becomes complicated. I think cloning is not really a reliable procedure for the routine production of organ source pigs because we have this high epigenetic variability. There may be unpredicted interactions between the various modifications, and some modifications may have unforeseen negative effects. And an example is the increased antigenicity of, uh, of pig organs that lack CMAH in non-human primates. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. Um, uh, I'm going to watch for some questions. Looks like there's uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of complexity yet uh, before we get where we need to get. All right. Um, we'll start with Dr. Uh, Auchincloss, please. Another beautiful presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, so what is the sweet spot? You've emphasized that with relatively few genetic modifications, we can do quite well, but surely relatively few isn't the ideal spot. What, what would be the ideal spot in your mind currently? So I believe that for heart transplantation, the knockouts of the three glycosylcrum cherases plus a solid expression of thrombomodulin on the endothelium and a solid expression of one complement regulatory protein, uh, CD46 maybe, could be sufficient for the first trials. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kimmel. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Wolf, for really a tour de force talk. Um, I have a question that may be a little bit tangential. I remember. Forty years ago, there were data that growth hormone in rodent models was not the only mediator of hypertrophy of the kidney after uninephrectomy. Are there other mediators of hypertrophy 
either for the kidney or the heart, that should be thought of besides growth hormone? Well, there are other mediators, but the problem is always when we interfere with this, we still have to make sure that the, the animals are more or less healthy and we can propagate them by breeding. And we looked at many other growth uh, regulating cascades, like uh, directly the insulin gro uh, insulin like growth factors, growth hormone itself. But uh, the knockout of the IGF-1 is lethal before birth. And the, OB, uh, the, the knockout of growth hormone itself is associated with breeding pro uh, problems. So the growth hormone receptor, uh, uh, the receptor knockout was the modification that affected the health of the donor animals uh, uh, minimally, basically. Yeah. But it's still, the same kind of question. Yeah. No, it's the question of the genetic sweet spot. I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted you. So, so, but still, the growth hormone receptor knockout pigs, they are not completely normal. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should, um, I should add, we did yeah. a holistic proteom study of the heart of these animals, and we did not detect any major difference that uh, we had the feeling could affect the function of the heart. So the heart seems to be relatively little affected. The liver is quite affected. Thanks for that addition. Um, Dr. Zeiss. Uh, hi, Dr. Wolf. I, I wonder what the possibilities are for um, conditional knockouts. Because if you consider things like mTOR, if you start competing, that's also lethal. Um, and that is pretty central to hypertrophy. Um, is it feasible to do conditional knockouts and to knock this out simply in the organ before it goes into the person? It is, in principle, possible. We can do also inducible transgene expression, but this, of course, complicates the whole thing enormously. And I think for a routine production of donor pigs, this is not suitable. This is suitable for experimental purposes, but not for the routine provision of, uh, of organs. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Fox. <laughs> I'll just add my, my comment that these have been two amazing presentations. Um, and, and while I think it's clear to me that what you've done is really setting the stage for very successful transplantation, one of the things I, I hadn't thought about it and was struck by in, in both presentations was this concept of the aging of the organ and the uh, looking at the timelines that you've done where you've transplanted tissues that are out 900 or 1,000 days. and um, learning about uh, how the organ is growing and, 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 and in the case of the heart, but in the case of the other organs, the, the aging process in the pigs. And um, how long do you think these organs will survive in humans once they're transplanted? If, if the immunobiology is appropriately handled so that rejection is not an issue, what is going to be the timeline? Is, is this something that over a period of 25 years, somebody might have to have multiple transplants of a organ? I would say not multiple, eventually two. So pigs have a life expectancy of 20 years or so. And you also have to consider that you start with a relatively young organs, organ, whereas uh, at least in Germany, 50% of the organ donors are older than 50 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you start with a young, you start with a young, healthy organ. Thank you. All right. Thank you again for that perspective. So I think now uh, we'll move to discussion of our questions. So we're moving to question four, and have a look at that question. Um, Transplantation of animal cells and organs into humans is associated with hyperacute rejection, vascular injury, cell-mediated rejection, and chronic rejection. Options for controlling rejection include genetic modification of donor pigs, modulation of the immune response in the recipient. Please discuss the most promising strategies to prevent rejection of pig organs. 
in our discussion, please consider the balance between potential benefits of the desired genetic modifications and or immune response modulation and the potential for detrimental transplant outcomes. So to get things rolling, we have uh, two discussions this morning. Uh, the first of those is Dr. Cooper. Dr. Butterfield, I hope you can hear me. Of course, just like technology, right at the time when I was uh, expected to talk, my computer decided it was not going to work. So can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. Uh, and I, yeah, we've had a flurry of updates as well today, so it's a little tough technologically. But please carry on. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, everyone. So I, I had the, uh, the unenviable task of actually following two of the most outstanding presentations I've heard on this topic not sure who I offended at the agency, but it really is incredibly interesting to, to follow the work that's been done thus far uh, and to um, consider really where we are today. I, I, won't, um, I won't look to recount everything that's been shared by our speakers except to say that, uh, again, I think we have uh, lots of opportunities, um, particularly when we think about the, the question and even as we tried to ask a number of our speakers, you know, what is kind of the, the minimum need and then what is uh, the absolute. Um, and those are two, I think, very sort of different questions. I think if we appreciate the fact that we do have, as opposed to allotransplantation, the advantage of, of time and genetic modifications, we do, I think, appreciate that we have, uh, again, the ability to control those minimums. And then as we continue to advance the science, along with, uh, as many have suggested, the need for um, kind of prospective, ongoing, adaptive clinical trials, we can continue, I think, to, to improve uh, our model and, and hopefully with that our outcome. We have an, really an alphabet of opportunities, but I think everyone would certainly agree, and our speakers, as many of our questions look to get to, would, would I think all agree that the minimum that's necessary is at least a, you know, a single gal knockout, although with a triple gal knockout, see, with a triple knockout, as um, Dr. Locke um, presented uh, during the, uh, the open session, you know, there is the ability to potentially open up opportunities for negative cross-matches for even a larger patient population. I'll, I'll get to more of that in a second. But some of the uh, additional things are, you know, complement regulatory proteins, um, thrombomodulin. You know, the ability to knock out growth hormone and PERV sounds uh, very uh, exciting and, and certainly uh, necessary for, you know, avoidance of some of the uh, infectious complications moving forward. We even have the ability for like we said, genetic modifications to, to improve the, uh, the, the physiologic compatibility, um, i.e. the ability for blocking growth hormone. Um, what we have to recognize is, as we've, again, looked at the, the progressive implementation of new transgenes, we, we don't really know in the, the human xenotransplant model what the addition of each of those transgenes means because we really have been unable to attest it in a non, a beyond a non-human primate model. And I, I think that's important. Many have said throughout the course of our two days that the, the xenotransplant um, is very species-specific. Um, and uh, unlike the non-human primates, in, in xeno cross matches, uh, that we can potentially modify that in humans with interventions that we, we currently use for Like, uh, sorry, I think I lost there for a second. No, um, that was me. Saying, I muted you by accident. Sorry about that, Matt. <laughs> Go ahead. I've, I've, I've had, I get that done on a regular basis, Michael. So I'd say, um, you know, the interventions such as plasmapheresis, um, total plasma exchange, and IVIG to reduce antibody levels have been demonstrated to be quite effective in reducing median channel shifts to allow for the avoidance of hypercube rejection. And so even in the, in the face of a of a single gal knockout, there's the opportunity to potentially allow for um, interventions that we currently use in allotransplantation, again, that would, again, minimize the additional uh, cost and time that's necessary to, to produce that ideal uh, transgenic and, and knockout pig that we continue to talk about. What we also have to recognize and reflect upon a lot of the conversations we had yesterday that is, uh, I look at it as a benefit. You know, often the, the transplant recipients you know, for, the, for many of the organs in which we you, utilize as a gift of life, they are somewhat frail, debilitated, may have some low-level infections that individuals like Dr. Fishman are keeping at bay with, uh, with uh, antibiotic therapy. But because of the a, a biosecure environment and uh, pathogen-free that we really have potentially the less risk of uh, exogenous microbes um, than we do have allotransplant. So we have to look at that as a potential benefit, even in the face of uh, the immunosuppression. I think 
what I've heard and what I've read in terms of, again, minimums of immunosuppression that's necessary. Um, uh, T-cell induction therapy with antithymocyte globulin, uh, maintenance therapy, combination of uh, co-stimulatory, co-stimulatory blockade with uh, either uh, CD40, anti-CD40 or anti-CD154, uh, combination with um, uh, anti-CD20 uh, for, for B-cell coverage, uh, and then maintenance therapy with uh, anti-metabolites and steroids. It's interesting. Um, I think um, uh, Dr. Pobleski tried to get to the question about, you know, our, our current use of standard immunosuppression that includes calcineurin inhibitors and, and, and recognizing that that model can't even be adequately tested in our non-human primates still sort of puts that question mark out there as to how valuable and really what the place is for our cornerstone immunosuppressive therapy for CNIs. I think, um, you know, what is also uh, important to recognize is that, again, the, that while the, the effects of, of standard of care immunosuppression has been evaluated as best possible in xenotransplantation, the non-human, non-human primate model, the, the specific effects of its use, namely the, the effect on the xeno organ itself um, amongst the, the various transplantable organs that we talk about, hearts and kidneys, we spend a lot of time it is still largely unknown in the human. Um, it's important to, to appreciate and exciting that um, groups like David Sachs and others are, are already well on their way to developing uh, tolerance with mixed chimerism and utilizing thymic uh, transplantation and Tregs. So very similar to what we're now currently doing in clinical trials and allotransplantation. And so, you know, we may be able to eventually think about, you know, that one side of the equation of our, um, of our uh, donor uh, still working towards perfection, but yet being able to remove immunosuppression on the recipient side. And so, again, I, I, I bring it all back saying that there's you know, tremendous opportunities. There's been, you know, science which has you know, really demonstrated with each adaptive uh, and increasing innovation that we've had uh, prolonged tolerance and successful survival of these, uh, of these animals. But really, you know, we're not going to know until we eventually get to the point where we feel comfortable enough that we have those minimums, um, that we feel safe, uh, which is, of course, the number one priority that allows us to move forward to these adaptive clinical trials that probably will allow us to get closer to determining what is truly enough in addition to what other uh, potential interventions we have available that we're using in the allo transplant uh, model. Uh, and then in addition, you know, what's the minimum amount of immunosuppression, if at all, uh, thinking that potentially being able to, to work towards tolerance, you know, maybe allow, maybe allow us to successfully see this um, from the, the bench truly to the clinical bedside. So, again, thank you for this opportunity. All right. Thank you so much. Um, We're going to move to our second discussant, um, Dr. Auchincloss, next, and then we'll have a discussion from the committee uh, members after that. Let me just make two points before we get to the general discussion. The first, I think, is kind of obvious now. When my experience of working with the FDA in the past has been that they like to show that each component of combination therapy is an important individual component. That approach clearly is not going to work here. We can't prove the benefit of one genetic modification uh, in xenotransplantation. I think we've heard repeatedly today that there has to be a cassette ranging from three to, to more genetic modifications. So it will not be one at a time. There needs to be a combination approach. The other uh, point that I'd make, at least in my mind, is that in discussing the balance between modifying the donor pig and immunosuppression of the recipient, I would strongly lean towards further modification of the donor pig rather than trying to increase immunosuppression of the recipient. To do so, I think, makes xenotransplantation a second-class option for a transplant recipient if they're going to have to have more immunosuppression uh, to make the organ survive. So I'd lean heavily towards further modification of the donor pig. I would close by just uh, turning back to to Dr. Pearson and and saying that uh, you mentioned that you think it it might actually turn out that less maintenance immunosuppression will be used for, for pig donors. And I'm curious to, to why you, you think that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, 
Let me see. Uh, yeah, so there was one particular question to uh, Dr. Pearson just now. So I'll ask Dr. Pearson to respond, and then uh, I'll be watching for hands uh, for questions and discussion from the committee members, please. Thank you. Uh, Hugh, to address your question, I think it refers back to the work we published in the 1980s uh, showing that the xenoimmune response is more vulnerable to selective uh, inhibition of CD4-mediated immunity, uh, whereas allotransplantation, you have to target both the CD4 and the CD8 cells uh, to prolong allograft survival. That was skin in mice, but that's now been shown for uh, kidneys in monkeys, pig kidneys in monkeys, uh, confirming similar work that was done by Alan Kirk and uh, Tony Dorling uh, in the interim. So the, um, I think that with more focused immunosuppression that has less deleterious long-term consequences, we're going to be able to uh, more safely protect the xenograft. That has the specific advantage when you deplete CD8 T cells, you eliminate a, a, a lot of the um, uh, antiviral immunity, and it's in that context that endogenous CMV reactivation occurs, which has deleterious consequences for the host as well as potentially for the, at least for allografts. We don't know if the xenograft will be similarly affected. Um, I think that co-stimulation, it, 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 I, I believe, uh, based on our work for 20 years on the pathway, that co-stimulation pathway blockade will be a safer and more effective immunosuppressive strategy, uh, as well as a bridge to tolerance. And so for those in those two different uh, but parallel veins, I think that co-stimulation-based immunosuppression is likely to find its way into allotransplant uh, um, uh, in a prevalent way in the next 10 years, but that's merely, that's merely an opinion, and uh, that remains to be demonstrated. To the one other point that I wanted to raise that in reference to Dr. Cooper's um, very nice commentary, we have spent the last 15 years taking uh, pig organs with progressive individual genetic modifications and studying them in a paired ex vivo lung perfusion model. And in that model, we've been able to show that, uh, that the advantage of individual genetic modifications on the hyperacute rejection response, which is what we have the opportunity to measure in, uh, in that model. There's also been work with limb perfusion done by the German group in cooperation with the Swiss that looked at the HLAE expression and demonstrated that that did have an effective, uh, a, a de demonstrable protective response, again, against early immune interactions when human blood was perfused through a limb of a genetically modified pig. So we do have human evidence that these genetic modifications, in several of these genetic individual genetic modifications do have a salutary effect. Uh, it, and there's other good in vitro evidence to support that as well as mechanistic basis. So I think it's not without evidence. It is not, it is at the same time, as you accurately point out, we are not going to be able to come at this and test each of these individual things by itself. But uh, based on logical inferences from the data we have, I think uh, very, for each organ, people will be able to, various investigators will be able to come up with plausible uh, strategies. And uh, I, I would encourage the regulators to look at it in a flexible way uh, as opposed to uh, a rigid way. And I don't know how that translates into the real world, but that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can ask um, for the specific to the CD40 uh, pathway inhibition, uh, is the thought there that you just need to transiently inhibit priming um, until tolerance is established? I'm, I'm sure you've said. So, with, if, if in the mixed hematopoietic chimerism context, transient blockade for just one month is the standard uh, approach in non-human primates and is effective 80% of the time, I think, in the kidney model. Um, I think in, in clinical translation, the immunosuppression has been continued for longer periods of time um, uh, in the MGH mixed hematopoietic chimerism experience. Uh, but the Immuno, the conventional immunosuppression in that case is continued, I think, for six months or uh, roughly. Uh, so I don't know 
I don't think anyone knows what the minimum duration necessary, but I think it will be possible with a tolerance induction approach to only require transient immunosuppression by, if in the absence of mixed hematopoietic chimerism or another tolerance induction approach, I do think that co-stimulation pathway blockade can be used safely for long-term immunosuppression, as is currently done with bilatacept as an alternative to um, higher dose calcineurin inhibitor uh, based immunosuppression. Thank you. All right, so um, we've had uh, a lot of great discussion um, and some recommendations so far. So I'm watching for hands from our committee members to uh, discuss um, the most promising strategies to prevent rejection and here a hyperacute rejection, vascular injury, cell mediated rejection um, in pig organs. Um, let's hear from Dr. Bloom. Well, the, the one thing that I would note, which really refers back to yesterday, is one thing we, that definitely has to be avoided and is going to be a major problem no matter how many genes you knock out, how you deal with cell-mediated rejection and stuff, is those donor animals have to be negative for the porcine cytomegalovirus. I mean, that seems to be in the, the presentations uh, that were from this morning, it seems to be that if that happens, it doesn't make any difference what else you do. That's going to uh, be a showstopper for uh, efficacy of the grass. Thanks. Thank you. All right, other thoughts about uh, and recommendations about the most promising strategies? Um, Dr. Fishman. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that what we've heard about are a large group of potential genetic modifications that are linked to specific immunosuppressive regimens. And so the notion that there is a best genetic modification pig is on the background, of, genetic background of that pig, and the uh, immunosuppression has been adapted to the modifications that are made. So I'm not sure that I'm hearing that there is a best immunosuppressive regimen or that there is a best pool of genetic modifications or even a best pig. I've heard that there is a set of all of the above that should be considered for each protocol. And we have found the same in human to human tolerance induction and the like, which is there is a bit of trial and error in it. Um, and as uh, Dr. Pearson pointed out, we don't know the best amount of time, for example, for tolerance induction, and we use immunosuppression for a conservative period of time. But in fact, hematopoietic chimerism is not maintained for a prolonged period of time. It's maintained for a number of weeks and then seems to go away, and the tolerizing effect is maintained. So there's some things we don't understand yet. So I think that my, my point is that we ought to have a package of pig genetic modifications, immune suppression for each protocol, but that no one protocol should be seen as intrinsically better than any others except based on preclinical data that may be available. So we have to analyze the experience of an individual team with an individual regimen um, in that setting. Uh, similarly, uh, if you use uh, certain uh, immune suppressive agents, you're more or less likely to stimulate infectious risk so that there is this balance of the whole package rather than an individual uh, strategy, I think. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, the least immunosuppression you can get away with, and, and Hugh Auchincloss made the point that what we're trying to do is use as many genetic modifications as we can to minimize exogenous immune suppression because of infectious risk. That makes intuitive sense, uh, but it is going to be a package regardless of which one we use. Thank you. Um, let's hear again from Dr. Cooper. Great. 
Th thank you very much. I, I, I'm actually you know, thankful that Dr. Fishman made that comment because I've come after you know days and days and days of preparation review and reading so many of these articles to come to a similar conclusion. So I guess I would perhaps then bring forth a question to the agency. With, with that recognition, at least maybe recognition by several, that there is a, a package of genetic modifications and immunosuppression availabilities. Do we think, however, to get to the next stage, which it sounds as if we're going to get to some form of clinical trials, that there is a minimum, though? Is there a minimum that will allow to say that it is safe to move forward, that when a sponsor comes forward, the FDA would say, this is a minimum that we require in order for uh, the ability for the movement into the next phase of clinical trials. Because it, it seems as if, again, we could have our pie in the sky sort of perfect genetically modified pig and, and eventually uh, be able to work towards uh, tolerance, but that's not going to happen overnight, as many have said. So what do we think is the, the minimum that's going to allow us to be able to go to the next stage? Um. I, I think I can put my psychic hat on and uh, suggest the response would be they want to hear that from us. Um, but uh, if, uh, if someone from the agency uh, wants to weigh in here, um, I'll, I'll watch uh, for that hand. We will, um, uh, we will hear from uh, FDA uh, after the open public hearing uh, later today. Um, so. Um, your psychic powers are uh, very good. Um, we, we appreciate the uh, concept that a, uh, a, the package may be different in, in different clinical trials uh, because there's a lot to learn. But uh, we, we are very interested in, in what the minimum is and, and this committee's thinking on what that minimum should be. Uh, Dr. Hirsch, you wanted to add something? Um, just to, to support Dr. Bryan's position, it, it's not the agency's position to tell sponsors how to create their medical products. Um, we want you to come to us with data to support your hypothesis and see how it goes. That being said, you know, we think the alpha-gal knockout is probably the minimum that you need to work with, and then the rest of it, you'll provide preclinical data to support. Terrific. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for adding uh, adding to the conversation right then. Um, uh, anything else, uh, Dr. Cooper? Okay. Um, let's hear from Mr. Conway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, one thing, Dr. Cooper, for the comments uh, that he's raised, and uh, also for uh, uh, Dr. Fishman. But I wanted to highlight in particular. Uh, what Dr. Oshinkloss talked about, and that's uh, from the viewpoint of patient consumers and especially those who are taking a look at the prospect of organ failure, um, this therapy, uh, I think what you want to try to avoid is having it viewed as a second-class therapy uh, or something where patients would have to go ahead and endure a higher regimen of immunosuppression. And I think that this particular question is a good one. Right at the end of it, it asks about the balance. Uh, between modifications and uh, immunotherapy. So on the allograft side, you know, it's been discussed what the patient burden is in terms of uh, diabetes, gastrointestinal issues, um, heart issues, and some of these other things. But I think one of the things that the agency should keep in mind as they look at this question of the balance, and this is a role for the agency, uh, sponsors will come forward, but they should be encouraged to bring forward with them patient insight data as well. And the reason why is because uh, the burden of managing pills, of um, trying to make certain that you're on top in terms of compliance as a transplant patient is significant. Uh, it's uh, a commitment that you have to make as a patient. In my case, I've taken over 170,000 pills since my transplant. 170,000. So I'm on it. I'm a counter. Not every patient is like that. The prospect of being able to have a therapy where you could have less of a regimen um, that might be more predictable and might have less side effects, I think is very, very important to keep in mind and be open to uh, harvesting those insights from patients, uh, both recipients and those who are yet to be transplanted, um, to get their voice into this conversation as the agency moves forward and looks at it. But I think uh, the presentation has been fantastic. And, and again, I think the questions posed by the doctors are 
good one in terms of tiering or segmenting uh, different pathways or different therapies uh, that we're considering and not having a must fit all one uh, size approach. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm starting to hear, uh, I think, some consensus and, and points uh, agreed upon. So if there are no more um, committee uh, comments at this time, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab at some, um, at, uh, some summarizing of some key points, and then we'll have a few minutes for people to add to that uh, if they would like to. So in terms of the most promising strategies, I think the, the theme is um, that more, uh, just echoed now uh, by Mr. Conway, um, more modifications to the donor uh, animals that could be propagated, um, studied, uh, added to um, over um, adding regimens uh, to the patients that might have um, a lot of side effects uh, over time. Um, that uh, we, we heard, uh, in fact, uh, suggested and supported uh, also by the agency that um, in terms of uh, genetic modifications, and the data are very strong about the um, alpha-gal knockout, and that uh, this might be considered the minimum, but there's, um, you know, as we've seen in the guest speakers, we've seen um, really striking changes in the uh, survival plots of organs with um, triple knockouts in, um, in these uh, different uh, carbohydrate um, molecules. We've seen um, thrombomodulin complement uh, as, as key pathways for genetic modifications that can have significant impact. So um, perhaps that minimum is closer to two, perhaps it's uh, four uh, genetic modifications uh, in the donor animal. Um, that can be accomplished without donor fitness, but also to keep in mind that there are key pathways where the specific modulations uh, would have to be matched to the uh, animals and their background, um, as well as the uh, target organs um, and the clinical setting, the clinical transplant setting to optimize, and that uh, it will probably, as in all biology and certainly immunology, uh, one size will not uh, fit all, and that this will be based on the data package uh, submitted. Um, but uh, those carbohydrates uh, complement cascades um, and um, that those and coagulopathies, those are all uh, critical pathways and that there are going to be limitations to the non-human primate models that can be studied um, because there could be effects specific to those that would not be expected uh, in humans. And so in, um, in all things we've talked about so far yesterday and today, it can be early. And a lot of the amazing genetic mod modifications we're now technologically capable of making um, remain to be tested. Um, to the extent possible in non-human primate models, but then ultimately uh, in patients. And then lastly, um, PERV and PCMV um, are also important targets um, that could be uh, genetically uh, eliminated um, in, uh, in the donor animals. So uh, with that, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Auchincloss to um, uh, add to that summary, please. Your summaries are really quite spectacular each time. Thank you very much. Um, I would simply second what you just said, I think, uh, which is GAL knockout alone is not the minimum. I think that GAL complement uh, regulation and coagulation mod mod modification are also a part of the minimum. But I'd be interested in our two speakers talking about what they think a minimum package might include. All right, with that uh, specific question um, to our, our two uh, guest speakers for that, um, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Pearson uh, and then Dr. Wolf if you would like to add um, uh, a brief specific about what you consider the minimum. I think for the kidney, there is a case to be made for the gal knockout uh, by itself in unsensitized patients. But I would be, I personally would be reluctant to bring that forward as a general strategy because I think the number of, the, it's only a minority of patients who uh, would have access to this in a clinical trial or in a, even if it were successful in a, as a clinical uh, therapy. I think the triple knockout, there's a better case for as a minimum for the kidney. 
but I still, if I, if it were me as a patient, would prefer that a complement regulatory protein be uh, included in that context uh, as a safety and as a protection in case of elicited antibody becoming a factor. Uh, the case for thromboregulatory molecule expression in the kidney has never been tested, and so, to the best of my knowledge, so I don't know what we can say about that. Although the evidence that Eckert cited showing that when complement and coagulation pathway regulatory molecules were expressed on the kidneys, it's actually data out of MGH um, uh, with the eugenesis pigs, it does look like having uh, expression of both of those genes may offer an advantage in, in that context. Uh, but in terms, so it, I think a hard and fast minimum, as has been alluded to, Dr. Butterfield, in your comments, and Matt, in your comments, a hard and fast uh, minimum is not the course that I would advise, but again, this is your, your job, not mine, uh, to make a recommendation and the FDA's decision, not mine. Uh, with respect to the heart, I think, as Hugh alluded to, uh, gal knockout is the minimum, along with complement regulator and thrombomodulin. Uh, triple knockout would probably be better for clinical application, but will be not possible to validate preclinically. So that is the caveat for a regulator in looking at the data set. But I think that case is very well established in the preclinical data that the triple knockout is not readily testable preclinically. So, uh, Hugh, I hope that answers your question, at least from my perspective, and I'll be delighted. I'd be very eager to hear what Eckert thinks. Thank you. Dr. Wolf? I think I can just echo this uh, statement. We, I don't have experience with kidney transplantation, but at least for the heart transplantation, I think it's uh, absolutely true what uh, Dr. Pearson said. For me, the question is would it be acceptable to work? with preclinically in baboons with a pig that has only a heterozygous CMAH knockout and later on nevertheless use organs that have a homozygous uh, CMAH knockout in humans because uh, there is no evidence that uh, this CMAH knockout could have a negative effect in humans and simply for the preclinical testing it disturbs the outcome of the results. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a few final words from members of the committee, Professor Fox, um, Dr. Morrison, and Dr. Wu, um, and then we'll see where we're at. No, thank, I agree, Dr. Butterfield, great summary again. And um, I guess I was just gonna comment um, about uh, trying to advise the FDA. I, I, given the data that, that we've heard, I kind of wonder why we, we don't push for for more, like uh, looking specifically at, at the triple knockout. And it was then continuing to be informative to listen to um, the last two presenters again discuss the, the impact of maybe thrombomodulin and maybe that there's not as much enough data in the kidney. But it, it seems that the, the that the inference from the preclinical data would be that it would be supportive, realizing that all the preclinical data may not advise us in terms of how it's going to work in the clinic. So uh, it, it seems like at least from our side there should be at least two, uh, the complement in addition to the alpha-gal and, and potentially the thrombomodulin. Um, and I guess I'd be weighing in to support all, all three of those uh, given the advantage that it has in, uh, in, in at least one of the settings preclinically. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morrison and then Dr. Wu. In the context of the conversation about minimal numbers of manipulations, I think it's really important to bear in mind that one of the things we heard is with a minimum set of manipulations, it may be necessary to pre-screen patients that have low levels of antibodies against certain antigens. So I think it's really important that we not pursue a strategy in which large numbers of patients wouldn't be candidates for the therapy because of pre-existing um, antibodies. Uh, when we're talking about minimal numbers of manipulations, it should be the minimum number of manipulations that would really maximize the fraction of the population that could potentially be treated with this approach. Thanks. Thank you. 
All right, Dr. Wu, and then we'll close it out with Dr. Zeiss. Yeah, so I have a question for uh, Dr. Pearson. Uh, with regard to the patient selection uh, for the uh, cardiac uh, uh, population, I think, you know, as you know, the patient in Maryland, uh, he was actually quite sick uh, before uh, he got the uh, pick heart. And so that also, skew that also makes it tougher to prove that the um, pick heart transplant is safe. On the other hand, if you pick a patient population that's uh, not so sick, there are other alternatives such as uh, these uh, many uh, LVATs that we can give uh, to, uh, to our patients. So I just want to want to get your thought on how do you pick the right population that uh, you know gives the best benefit to the uh, to the patient without taking away some readily available uh, options that are just as good if not better. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Question that was a question for Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Dr. Wu. That's a great question. Uh, it's one that we've tried to address in uh, two recent publications, one in circulation in 2020 and one that was published in Transplantation just last week. Um, I would refer you to those publications for a detailed consideration uh, that ha includes some treatment of kidney as well as heart. There are a, There's a subpopulation of our end-state heart failure patients who are either highly sensitized to allo antigens but not to pig antigens who might benefit significantly from early access to a heart xenograft, timely access to a heart xenograft. Uh, additionally, populations of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, patients with amyloidosis, for example, can get into trouble with arrhythmias and fall off a cliff quite rapidly. And for them, an LVAD, even the small LVADs, uh, at least the HeartMate 3 is a poor choice that doesn't fill well and doesn't give good support. And the truly micro LVADs, the, uh, the um, Impella style that uh, are only approved for short-term use. We don't yet have a durable long-term VAD that can support patients through recovery of kidney function and on to a desensitization protocol, et cetera. So uh, there are... Not, not to go on too long, but I, I think there are populations of heart failure patients for whom a heart xenograft would be an attractive alternative, either as a bridge to an allograft or as, as destination therapy, as a definitive uh, treatment option. So, um, and, and as I say, the, uh, the more extensive treatment of that, I think you can find published and for the committee's reference. Thank you, Tim. All right, and we will close this out uh, by hearing from Dr. Seiss. A uh, question for, for Dr. Wolf. Um, I wonder if the growth hormone receptor deficient mutation may not have a use in renal transplantation, transplantation in children. Um, children with chronic kidney disease can become growth hormone receptor uh, or sort of growth hormone resistant and they can have stunted growth. And the treatment for that is recombinant growth hormone. If you were to add that on top of the intrinsic capacity of the organ to grow, you could have a real problem in children. And using those particular mutants may be very valuable in children. All right, uh, Dr. Wu. I'm not sure if I completely understood your question. You are asking whether growth hormone receptor deficient organs could have an advantage for children or, or could be a problem for children. Um, could have an advantage specifically for renal transplantation, transplants in children where children with chronic kidney disease can become growth hormone resistant and they are treated with recombinant growth hormone. And so having an organ that is transplanted that would be resistant to responding to that. Right. Because yeah. human growth hormone can bind to the pig growth hormone receptor. I think for this very special case, it could be, it could be beneficial also uh, even the smaller pig strains that are available, for instance, the Tucatan pig, uh, whose organs would fit for adult humans, they would be too large for children. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for all of the discussion, all the questions, uh, and all the perspectives. So, I'm sorry, do we also have uh, a final word from Dr. Hirsch?
Uh, yeah, I had a scientific question for Dr. Pearson and um, Dr. Wolf. In regard to all the human immodulatory genes that have been knocked in in various of these pigs, has there been any sense that they changed the pig's ability to fight off viral infection in an unpredictable way? I guess I'll start that. The short answer is no. Uh, I'm aware that the CD46 um, uh, membrane cofactor protein is a receptor for, I think it's the mumps virus, or it's, it's a, I think that's correct. Um, yeah. To the best of my knowledge, it does not increase the susceptibility of the pig to any viruses that our pigs are exposed to. So there's no health effect associated. Is it possible that that gene expressed on the pig organ would be, in, have a clinical effect if our patient got mumps or measles? And the kidney then, in theory, would be more susceptible to uh, binding the virus, you know, being uh, infected by the virus. Uh, whereas it might not be with pig, CM, uh, pig membrane cofactor protein. That's the only potential context in which I can see the complement regulatory protein expression potentially having a deleterious effect with respect to infectious disease. Eckert? Uh, uh, I would answer in the same way, uh, and I think it should not be a major problem because humans express these proteins anyway, so I don't see an, an increased risk uh, introducing human proteins into into pig organs. Yeah, I think I was more concerned about whether the pigs themselves might be more susceptible to viruses that we might not be as aware to be screening them for. I think that was more the context I was considering. I think the context that I would recommend uh, to consider that, these animals, source animals for human organ grafts are going to be uh, the husbandry is going to be quite stringent, and the porcine CMV illustrates one reason why. Uh, but the regulatory agency has been very clear that that is going to be best practice and will be required, and I completely support that. This is These are exposure of these pigs to human viral pathogens is preventable and should be avoided and should be documented to whatever to the extent that Dr. Fishman tells us it's necessary to document that. That is what we ought to do. But I, it, again, I don't want to suggest that there should be a requirement that we document, document, document all kinds of things which are highly improbable. If you have an animal housed, derived by cesarean section and raised in a specific pathogen free environment and only coming into contact with uh, humans that who are in moon moon, moon suits uh, and you know they're they're I think the risk is so low that uh, requiring documentation is probably not is probably overkill not necessary. Thank you, Bill. Well. Well, no, I, I would fully agree, yeah. and also an allograft is not without an infectious risk. Yeah? I think we can control the xenografts much better. Okay, it looks like we have two more last questions um, that pertain directly to question four. Um, Dr. Beeston. Oh, sorry, I had Jay first. Sorry. <laughs> ah, oh, sorry, the hand had gone away. Uh, all right, Dr. Fishman, please. Well, just uh, to echo what Robin Pearson said and Eckert, um, the mo genetic modification, the only downstream effect not really implicated for viral infection, but if complement levels are normal, they should not have increased risk for bacterial, particularly encapsulated bacterial organisms as well. So I think it would be an easy assay to do to make sure that complement levels are normal, that immunoglobulin levels are normal in the normal <coughs> animals, but otherwise uh, one wouldn't necessarily anticipate uh, an infectious risk secondary to the genetic modifications. And the easiest thing is, are the animals healthy? And I think if they're healthy, then uh, we probably have addressed that question. Thank you, Dr. Fishman. And finally, Dr. Beeston. Good afternoon. Thank you for these great presentations. 
So I have, I have a question about all of the manipulation. Um, in their article, uh, Porat uh, described alter overall structural fun structural integrity changes in the renal parenchyma and suggested that this could be related to the genetic manipulations. So I was wondering how you're looking at these animals as you're doing the manipulations and looking for the integrity of the organs over time. And, you know, this pig had a number of alterations, including growth hormones. So can you make a little comment on how these are going to be chosen and how the normal aging of pigs might be changed from these? And, and then, you know, certainly it's, it may not poss be possible that one pig could be a source for multiple transplants. Like it could not give a heart and kidneys to, to patients because the manipulations are particularly developed for those uh, organs. So if you can talk a little more about these choices and then how you're following up on the consequences of these choices, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Becker, do you want to start? And I'll, or I've had the first go on all the other questions. Can you hear me? Uh, he's re he's reconnecting his audio. Hold on a second. So let me, uh, while he's doing that, why don't you take it away, away first, sir, and then we'll come back sure. to him. Sorry. I, so I think that the pigs that are brought forward for heart will have enough, will have sufficient genes to be used as kidney donors as well. So it may be that while not all the genes are needed for the kidney, that it will be convenient and uh, con may prove eventually to be uh, advantageous to have a, uh, additional genes. And the same goes for CD47, for HLAE, and some of the other genes that are in some of the constructs. It, it will take time for us to understand uh, how consistent the expression of the various specific genes is in the individual animals that come forward for transplantation. As Eckert so nicely said, the epigenetic modifications present in cloned animals may have adverse effects or unpredictable effects on how particular genes are expressed uh, and other aspects of the health of those animals. Um, and so his comment that in the eventually the product that gets approved for clinical use and goes into widespread clinical use should almost certainly be from bred animals in whom the breeding process should correct those epigenetic problems that are associated with cloning. That said, the majority, some cloned animals do not thrive and die in utero or in infancy or in during their maturation phase. And some of them go through crises during their maturation, but then uh, get over those uh, problems. And as a consequence, I would uh, advocate that cloned animals can and perhaps must be used as the initial trial subjects, doing all we can to make assure animal health and then assessing retrospectively <coughs> over or under expression of particular genes is associated with better or worse outcomes as one begins to develop a body of evidence. Once we have a body of evidence, it'll be much easier to say that the minimum gene set for kidney and the minimum gene set for heart are the same or different, and it will become easier for us to say that additional expression of XYZ additional transgenes or XYZ additional knockouts is advantageous or not. But I think we can't expect that that's going to come from preclinical data at this point. And I think we are far enough along in our preclinical database that I would, I, I have made the strong case that I think we're ready to start trying some of these candidate strategies. And those will depend on what pigs are available to each of these groups and what evidence they can come forward to the FDA with showing that this is sufficient, sufficiently dependable uh, and sufficiently effective in the preclinical model as to justify confidence on the part of us 
and our IRB and the FDA that we're doing something sensible. And our patients and or your patient advocate, I encourage you to hear his voice and uh, uh, in, in what he would feel comfortable with going forward with. The comment by Poirier among the comments in the paper was that the tissues of that pig organ were fragile. And uh, the ultrastructural uh, abnormalities that were described, I don't know what to make of them. I'm not a renal pathologist. Uh, the fact that that kidney had normal function in the donor and then was still alive three days later. Again, I, I don't know what to make of the ultrastructural uh, abnormalities. Is that a cloning artifact? Is that a consequence of the human transgene expression? Is it a comp associated with the carbohydrate knockouts? Uh, simply, we do not know. And nor do we know how many, what proportion of the pigs produced have this. It might be worth asking that question. But I, I don't know that I would put a lot of weight on that individual unique observation. Eckert? And I think that probably ties to question five that we'll be coming to uh, later today. Dr. So Wilson. In, uh, I think in order to demonstrate the integrity, it's necessary to characterize precisely the transgene integration site. And this can now be done easily with long read sequence, sequencing and also to perform functional studies on, on, on the organs uh, the heart, for the heart and the kidney. This can be easily done in the, in the donor pig already. By ultrasound for the heart and, and kidney and then just by... Yeah. You, I don't think you need to measure cardiac output in a healthy pig, but I think you can measure creatinine simply or, or B1 and so. Yes. And the proteinuria, so in the kidney, so. Dr. Thank you very did much. That, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, so um, I think a little preview of some of the things that we'll probably talk about um, after the break. So right now, I'd like to again thank everyone, and we're going to move to uh, a lunch break. The open public hearing will be next. That'll be 10 a.m. here in San Francisco. That'll be 1 p.m. on the U.S. East Coast. So um, thank you all. See you back then. All right, and with that, let me switch this over to lunch. And studio, again, we're going to take a, just want to make sure, a, we're going to come back at once. We're taking a 34-minute break. So studio, go ahead and uh, kill our feed.
Okay, and welcome back to FDA 73rd meeting of the Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee meeting. I'm going to hand it back to our chair, Dr. Lisa Butterfield. Dr. Butterfield, take it away. Thank you very much. All right, uh, welcome back and welcome to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it's important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your oral statement to advise the committee of any financial interests relevant to this meeting, such as financial relationship with any company or group that may be affected by the topic of this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you, at the beginning of your statement, to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address the issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. So with that, um, we'd like to get started with the open public hearing, um, and I'll hand this to Christina Vert, our DFO. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. <clears throat> What are my camera's doing? Okay, I'll go ahead. Before I begin calling the registered speakers, I'd like to add the following guidance. FDA encourages participation from all public stakeholders in its decision-making processes. Every advisory committee meeting includes an open public hearing OPH session, during which interested persons may present relevant information or views. Participants during the open public hearing session are not FDA employees, or members of this advisory committee. FDA recognizes that the speakers may present a range of viewpoints. The statements made during this open public hearing session reflect the viewpoints of the individual speakers or their organizations and are not meant to indicate agency agreement with the statements made. Now I will go ahead and call on the first open public hearing speaker, which is <clears throat> Dr. Eliza Katz. Thank you. Do you see my first slide? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Eliza Katz. I am the Chief Medical Officer of eGenesis. Uh, I'm fully employed by eGenesis and holding a uh, stock option of eGenesis. I would like to thank the committee and the FDA for the opportunity to present some of the agency's perspective on this important topic uh, that we're all discussing here in the last two days. Next slide, please. Uh, eGenesis is utilizing state-of-the-art gene engineering technology to produce human-compatible porcine organ for transplantation. Next slide. To bring this technology to clinical use, eGenesis, like many others, has been engaged over the last few years in an extensive preclinical transplantation studies of pulsing organs into non-human primates. Although a tremendous amount of data and knowledge were generated, most of us here today would agree that transplantation models of pulsing organs to non-human primates have significant limitations. We can also agree that especially in human study will be critical in establishing proof of concept and open the door for further development of this important innovation. We can also agree that first in human clinical study is not aimed to provide final and definite answers. And therefore, we advocate a need for a practical and effective path to first in human proof of concept study. Our approach utilizes F0 clones donors produced in a specified pathogen-free barrier facility for our GLP studies and our first in human proof of concept study. Next slide, please. The production of pulsine donors starts with the generation of well-characterized nuclear donor cells in which the genomic edits are confirmed the off-target effects are characterized, 
and screening of advantageous agents is performed. The genetic edits include the knockout of the three sugar antigens associated with hyperacute rejection and the insertion of human transgenes at a safe harbor within the porcine genome to mitigate coagulopathy, complement system activity, and immune system activation. Next slide, please. This nuclear donor cell undergo electrofusion with all sites from a controlled donor population to generate the embryo, which then being implanted to a control surrogate who gives birth to the F0 clone donors. These clone donors are maintained in a clean burial facility and are fully characterized, including the conformation of the genetic edit, the assessment of off-target effects, the screening for advantageous agents, and the evaluation of the donor health. Next slide, please. Control of infection risk from advantageous agents, including porcine and endogenous retrovirus, is critical for the success of xenotransplantation, as we held in length in the last two days uh, during our discussion here in the committee. PERVS has been shown to be potential in uh, infect human cells and therefore pose a potential risk for poison organ transplant recipients and the larger community. To reduce this risk, we use CRISPR Cas9 technology to inactivate the retrovirus reserve transcriptase copies in the porcine genome, eliminating viral replication and avoiding the risk of transplantation. And, oh, sorry, of transmission. In addition, we plan to adopt practical approach for monitoring and controlling advantageous agents. To do that, we believe we need to work in collaboration with porcine and human infectious disease experts, with our colleagues in industry, and of course, agency. Next slide, please. In summary, eGenesis position on the path to clinic in xenotransplantation includes the use of specified pathogen-free F0 clone porcine donor organs to be evaluated in our GLP safety studies, the, using, the use of the same organs for the first in human clinical study, and the reduction of infectious disease risk that will include inactivation of PERV and the implementation of well-designed plan for the mitigation and control of advantageous agents. This approach, we hope, will provide for a practical path to proof of concept first in human clinical study and open the opportunity for bringing this life-changing innovation to patients in it. Thank you very much for listening and for the opportunity to present for you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Sanjay Dutta. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sanjay Dutta. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer with JDRF International, the leading charitable organization funding type 1 diabetes or T1D research. JDRF's vision is a world without T1D, and our mission is to improve lives today and tomorrow by accelerating life-changing breakthroughs to cure, prevent, and treat T1D and its complications. JDRF does not have any financial disclosures. The key points I will focus on today are, one, the unmet need that exists in T1D, and two, the potential for xenotransplantation to meet these needs. In particular, Forcing islet xenotransplantation presents a solution to the shortage of human islets as a potential cure for T1D. For the 1.6 million Americans with T1D, the mainstay of disease management, insulin, has been around for over 100 years, but it is not a cure. The burden and risks of lifelong T1D disease management falls almost entirely on people with T1D and their caregivers, requiring 24-hour-a-day diligence to maintain glycemic levels, prevent long- and short-term complications, and survive. 
While technologies to administer insulin and monitor glucose levels have improved, subcutaneous exogenous insulin replacement is not physiologic and is insufficient to restore the body's natural ability to maintain glucose homeostasis. For example, data from the T1D exchange registry in the U.S. shows us that less than one-third of people with T1D in the U.S are consistently achieving target hemoglobin A1C levels. And on average, those with T1D have a decade less lifespan than the general population. Among the leading causes of mortality for people with T1D are renal failure and heart failure. Although human organ donors can successfully address end organ failure, the supply of human organs is insufficient to meet the demands and xenotransplantation could be a potential approach to address this unmet need. As evidenced by the successful phase three safety and efficacy study of cadaveric islets led and funded by the NIH Clinical Islet Transplantation Consortium, transplantation of donor human islets could be a cure for T1D. Results of that trial showed that islet cell transplantation can significantly improve glycemic control protect patients from severe hypoglycemic events, and restore counter-regulatory measures while improving quality of life, and for some, provide insulin independence for up to five years or longer. However, the available supply of human donor islets is limited, and these transplants require chronic immunosuppression, which further limits the use of this treatment to only a subset of those with T1D. Therefore, JDS is supporting a multi-pronged approach to support the research of curative therapies that could provide a replenishable source of cells and reduce or eliminate the need for chronic immunosuppression. This multi-pronged approach includes research in xenotransplantation, which builds on the following. One, we know that the cell types and cellular architecture of pig islets are a very faithful model for human biology and diabetes. Two, pigs could be a source of islets that could potentially be more abundant and could benefit from stricter quality control than is possible with human islets. And three, there is a long history of success with pig insulin for the treatment of this disease. Transplantation of pig islets could be a promising avenue to develop new cures for T1D. Data is available to show that neonatal and adult foreseen islets are able to correct diabetes in immune-compromised mice, pigs, and non-human primates. Progress in genetic modification of the source pigs has allowed the generation of animals that are free of defined pathogens and also free of specific targets for immune rejection by human recipients. This offers the opportunity to improve the engraftment and survival of islet xenografts. To that end, JGF has funded non-clinical research using gene editing of pancreatic pig islets to remove xenoantigens likely to trigger hyperacute rejection, as well as research with encapsulation devices designed to prove, pro provide immunoprotection. And first in human clinical studies of encapsulated pig islets have shown promising results in both early efficacy signals and safety with no zoonotic infection issue detected thus far. We encourage the FDA and the advisory committee to consider all available scientific information to develop reasonable and adaptive regulatory pathways for products derived from xenogenic sources. We also encourage FDA and the advisory committee to consider existing regulatory guidance from other agencies worldwide as to the extent possible, globally aligned regulatory frameworks will help research and development and speed patient access for curative therapies. This is especially important shot. for complex novel areas such as this and for diseases like T1D where the unmet need remains significant. In summary, despite advances since the discovery of insulin over 100 years, morbidity and mortality rates, as well as disease burden for those with T1D, remain unacceptably high. We need cures. 
We thank the committee and FDA for their careful consideration of not only the risks of xenotransplantation, but also the potential benefits of those awaiting organ and tissue transplants as potential cures for T1D. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes the open public hearing, and I thank you for your comments and presentations, and I will now hand the meeting back over to Dr. Butterfield. Great. Thank you so much, and we appreciate those perspectives from the open public hearing. Um, now, as we move to discuss our final questions five and six for today, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Beeston um, from uh, OTAT and CBER for her presentation. Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Beeston, a clinical reviewer in the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies. Today I will give a brief introduction for clinical considerations for functional studies of pig organs that will be used for transplantation. With improvements in surgical techniques, tools, donor recipient man matching, and immunosuppressive regimens, the success of transplantation can exceed 90% at one year and 10 year survival has surpassed 50%. The success of kidney transplant is greater than that for liver transplant, which is greater than that for heart transplant. Living donor transplants are more successful than cadaveric donor transplants. While these are life-saving and life-improving strides, there is a shortage of donors, living or deceased, compared to the number of patients on waiting lists. And some potential recipients have characteristics that make achieving a match near impossible. To address the imbalance between the need for transplantation and the availability of donors, the use of organs from other species has been considered for more than a century, with tissues and cells being investigated in the more recent past. As discussed previously by Ms. Archidiakono, there has been much interest in the considerations for donor animal, the requirements for immunosuppression, and the risks for zoonoses. We must remember that the purpose of transplantation is to provide replacement of function for organs, tissues, or cells that are no longer able to support life or to treat life or to treat serious and life-threatening conditions in patients. Therefore, it is important to consider whether the product obtained from the source animal is sufficient to approximate the physiology of the human organ, tissues, or cells that it is meant to replace. Surgical techniques for organ transplantation, heart, lung, liver, and kidney are well established. However, there are no data to determine the appropriate criteria for organ selection, such as the age of the source pig or the size of the organ. The clinical review starts with input provided by the Chemistry and Manufacturing Controls, CMC, and pharmacology toxicology, or PT, reviewers, as this information forms the basis of the evaluation of the safety mitigations contained within the proposed clinical protocol. As presented by Dr. Hirsch, the CMC reviewer determines that the organ, tissues, or cell obtained from the source animal meets the requirements for transplantation. The farm tox reviewer considers whether the animal model is appropriate for clinical condition or disease these considerations include, but not, are not limited to, the route of administration, which should mimic the proposed clinical route as much as possible, and include the surgical approach, delivery devices, concomitant medications, and immunosuppressive regimens that would be the same or similar as those proposed for the clinical study. While immunosuppressive regimens for allogenic transplants are well established, immunosuppressive regimens that are appropriate for the xeno organ tissues or cells are not well established. The farm tox evaluation of immunosuppressive regimens for xeno transplantation in non human primates is limited because commonly used drugs may not be as effective or well tolerated in non human primates. This also limits the ability to demonstrate prolonged function in the transplanted organ. To assess the proposed clinical studies, the clinical team considers data gathered from preclinical study endpoints for safety and organ function. I will in introduce two of the major potential safety issues that would be considered in the review of the proposed clinical protocol. 
In general, if the transplanted organ tissues or cells cannot meet or approximate replacement of the human organ tissues or cells, this mismatch can pose a risk to the recipient. Allergenic kidney transplant has the expectation that the donor kidney will provide replacement therapy. The move to xenotransplant requires consideration of the kidney's functions and the need to explore whether the xeno kidney can provide replacement of all of these functions. And if not, can the risks of these physiologic mismatches be mitigated? In addition to waste removal, the kidney regulates electrolytes and is a complex organ, endocrine organ that produces, converts, and responds to hormones. The actions of these hormones are not always conserved across species. I will describe a few examples of these complex functions. We will start with fluid balance, blood pressure, and electrolyte balance. Potassium phosphate wasting has been reported in pig to cinemologous monkey bilateral nephrectomy model. And free water wasting has been reported in a non-human primate model and raises concerns for a potential mismatch for response to vasopressin. In sodium regulation, cell excretion is influenced by several natriuretic peptides which act on the kidney and salt sparing is achieved through the renal sympathetic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. We know that porcine renin does not cleave human angiotensinogen. The vitamin D parathyroid, or PTH, axis is critical in maintaining calcium and phosphate levels within the appropriate physiologic range. The kidney is the site of one alpha hydroxylation of 25 vitamin D to produce the active form of vitamin D in response to PTH. PTH also promotes tubular reabsorption of calcium while inhibiting phosphate reabsorption. The amino acid sequence for PTH is not conserved between humans and pigs, and the response to the pig kidney to, of the pig kidney to human PTH has not been described. Porcine erythropoietin is only 80% homologous to non-human primate erythropoietin and does not support non-human primate erythropoiesis. Similarly, porcine erythropoietin does not support human erythropoiesis. While not unique to the kidney, it should be noted that pigs and primates have a mismatch in the coagulation cascade, and this mismatch can increase the risk of thrombus formation and requires consideration during the transplant and post-transplant periods. We must also consider the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of drugs that will be used in the peritransplant period to provide immunosuppression, to manage the recipient's other medical problems or complications that may occur from the transplant procedure or immunosuppression. There are drugs such as SGLT inhibitors, I'm sorry, SGLT2 inhibitors for the treatment of diabetes that act on the kidney. It is important to understand whether the xeno kidney and the human kidney have similar responses to these drugs. In addition, the xeno kidney and the human kidney may have different, different metabolisms of some drugs, and this difference could result in underdosing, leading to ineffective therapy, or overdosing, leading to possible toxicity. Such differences in metabolism would be most critical for drugs that have a narrow therapeutic range. Additionally, some drugs can be toxic to organs. It is important that the drugs used in the post-transplant period are not tox toxic to the transplanted xeno organ. In summary, FDA considers the potential benefit and the potential risks of all stages of clinical development. The hope for benefit is for the transplanted organ tissues or cells to provide the intended physiologic and functional replacement. However, with this benefit comes many risks, both known and unknown. Risks from the route of administration include risks associated with implantation procedures, such as bleeding and infection, and risks associated with the site of implantation based on the organ, tissues, or cells to be translated. Yesterday, Ms. Archie Diacono introduced considerations for immunosuppression regimens and infectious risk. Today, I have presented a brief discussion of considerations for physiologic mismatch in the case of a kidney xenotransplantation and considerations for clinical pharmacology. For recipient safety, it is important to consider the requirements of the transplanted organ 
tissues or cells, in our example, the pig kidney, to provide replacement therapy. The clinical protocol should identify the risks associated with the proposed treatment and provide a specific plan to mitigate these risks. Such a plan should consider the subject eligibility criteria, the treatment plan, safety monitoring, and management of physiologic mismatch. FDA is looking forward to the committee's discussion of question five and six on considerations of evaluation of pig organs that will be used for xenotransplantation to replace human organs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beeston. Um, we have uh, time for some questions uh, about uh, Dr. Beeston's presentation. So I'm going to watch for uh, hands up from the committee members. Um, I appreciate your highlighting a number of things that we're going to have to think about uh, and discuss as we move into questions five and six, focusing on organ function. All right, so I'm not seeing any uh, questions immediately from the uh, committee members. So why don't, um, okay, we do have one uh, from Mr. Conway. Thank you. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for uh, walking through uh, your presentation. It was very good. Uh, I have one question for you, and I know that this has been a source of uh, discussion at FDA and also among patient advocates. Um, it's a pretty clear understanding, I think, among patient advocates what the role of the science of patient insights is on the device side of FDA. But for those patient advocates that are listening and for those patients and families that are listening to have unique insights, can you tell us what the role of those insights are in deliberations like this on the drug side of FDA? Thank you. Well, we do really appreciate the input from patients and their caregivers. Uh, as you heard yesterday, we also have an additional consideration for public health because of the risk of zoonosis, so we also you know, consider those. I heard you today say that you want this to be simpler. So my goal is to make sure we have a good understanding of what is ahead of us. So if some of these physiologic mismatches I've mentioned requires a greater burden on you, I, I, I don't know that that would be satisfactory, but it might be with uh, testing prior to doing the transplants, we may understand ahead of time which which drugs may be better, which other things that we could do to further modify that. Um, so, you know, we do give this a lot of thought. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you both. So um, if there are no other questions right now um, regarding uh, Dr. Beeston's presentation, then um, I think we'll go ahead and move to our other speaker. Um, so we have an invited speaker on pig toxicology studies, uh, Dr. Helka um, from Medical University of South Carolina. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, it has become um, obvious during the last two days why we're talking about pigs in this session, but why are we talking about toxicology in pigs? I think Dr. Um, Beeson just highlighted why we're having this discussion now. Um, so far, we've been talking about very relevant and specific concerns with xenotransplantation. The talks we've heard are promising and optimistic that we are very close to xenotransplantation. I'm going to talk more about hypothetical, hypothetical but very real concerns that we've not yet discussed. We need to be sure that any drugs given to humans that have had a successful xeno, xenotransplant will be metabolized in a similar manner um, to the native organ or that we know and are prepared for any differences in metabolism so that any differences or concerns regarding metabolism can be anticipated and addressed. Um, Dr. Wolf was the first person today to mention the different breeds and why it may be important to consider this. Today I'm going to discuss the different pig breeds used in research. Um, I'm going to talk about drug metabolism, including not only some of the enzymes that are involved, but also the locations and organ systems important in drug metabolism and current knowledge of such in the pig. And one of the things we learn in vet school is that many species have breed differences, as breeds are selectively bred for specific traits or characteristics. 
This is also true for pigs and leads to some of the differences we see in the drug metabolism. The Hanford breed was originally bred in 1958 and is currently used for dermal toxicity, but with its size similar to humans, it's a good surgical model and is often selected for cardiovascular studies because the size of the heart of the adult Hanford um, breed is similar to humans. The Sinclair breed was the first breed developed specifically for research, and it was originally developed by the Hormel Center at the University of Minnesota in 1949. There's one lineage of this breed that actually has a melanoma that spontaneously regresses, so it is used in cancer research as well. They're currently selectively breeding this line for to be even smaller and with white skin to be used in dermal um, toxicity studies. The current Yucatan population used in research are descendants of only 25 animals that were imported to Colorado from Mexico in the 1960s. This breed is very easily trained and is quite docile. And again, there's also a white hairless line for dermal um, toxicity studies. The Gottingen was originally bred in beginning in 1969 at the University, University of Got Gottingen. They are bred from the Vietnamese potbelly pig, the landrace, and the Minnesota mini pig. That being said, um, it has since been made available outside of the European Union. And this is great because it, it's the same breed being used everywhere, but what has happened is they've developed all of these different breeding colonies. And what happens with that is you end up with genetic deviation or drift from one colony to another, like you would see in mouse research. And this becomes potentially relevant when looking at these drug metabolizing enzymes. I would be remiss if I did not also mention the breeds used in Asia. And there are numerous pig breeds, but I'm only going to mention these two. Um, the Micro Mini, which is commonly used in Japan, and the Bama, which is used in China. Both of these breeds have been studied for their utility in toxicology studies, and many papers have been published examining the amounts and activities of drug metabolizing enzymes in these breeds. So if you look at the toxicity literature, these breeds are very commonly represented. And finally, there are the agricultural breeds. There are many different agricultural breeds, but these three, the Yorkshire, Duroc, and Landrace, are the ones that are most commonly used in research studies. They're not typically used in toxicity studies, um, but if you'll remember, as I mentioned about the mini pigs, many of them have one of these um, agricultural breeds in their lineage. And now I'm going to switch gears and talk very briefly about drug entry pathways. So drugs enter the body via the mouth, by, by injection, or topically. After entry into the body, the drug will have contact with cells. For drugs taken orally, the drug must enter the um, gastrointestinal epithelium, and this can be via passive diffusion or by active transporters. In some cases, the drug is then transported intact into the bloodstream, but the drug may also undergo metabolism within the epithelial cells. After it enters the bloodstream, the drug can then be delivered to the liver and the kidney, which are both important organs of drug metabolism. Drug metabolism is composed of phase one reactions, phase two reactions, and finally by elimination. And we'll be talking more about these later in the presentation. There are not many studies looking at transporters in the pig and comparing to those in humans, but a few, but few of the references that are available state that the transporters do have similarity between pigs and humans, and it's about approximately a 72% sequence homology between the species. A couple of transporters that have been looked at in the pig are the ATP binding cassette or ABC transporters and the solute carriers or SLCs. The ABC transporters are, transporters are efflux transporters which help to move the drug out of the cell and the um, P-glycoprotein-1 or multidrug resistance-1 transporter can be in inhibited or induced. The breast cancer resistance protein or BRCP, BCRP is also an efflux transporter found in both pigs and humans. SLC transporters are influx, tra in influx transporters helping transport drugs into cells. The organic ion transporters are OATS and organic cation transporters, or OCT, are SLC transporters that are also found in the pigs 
although several individual genetic variations have been found in the organic cation transporters. Um, there is a group of scientists examining these different transporters, and they're known as the International Transporter Consortium. And as we'll see later, they're still determining which transporters are present and relevant in humans. Um, and there's really nobody looking at this in pigs. We're just basing what we look at in pigs um, on what we find in humans. So next I want to go ahead and discuss the first reaction that happens after the drug enters the cell, and that is the phase one reaction. These reactions expose functional groups of the parent compound, which may result in either increased or loss of drug activity. They result in the exposure of functional groups for phase two reactions. The phase one reactions are either oxidative, reductive, hydrolytic, or dealkylating in nature. The enzymes that mediate these reactions include the phytochrome P450 enzymes, which we'll hereafter I will refer to as SIP enzymes or um, SIPs. The SIP enzymes are, are the enzymes in all species that are most frequently involved in drug metabolism. Other enzymes that can facilitate these reactions include the flavin monooxygenases, the monoamine, monoamine oxidases, molybdenum hydroxylases, in addition to others. And for those of you that are interested, I've included the reactions catalyzed by the cytochrome P450 families. I'm not a biochemist, but I wanted to highlight an example of a hypothetical um, SIP hydroxylation. And after the product has been released from the active site, which you'll see at um, number six, the enzyme returns to its original state with a water molecule returning to occupy the distal port position of the iron nucleus. Depending on the substrates and the enzymes involved, the P450 enzymes can catalyze any of a wide variety of reactions. And because of the vast variety of reactions catalyzed by the SIPs, the activities and properties of many of the SIPs differ in many aspects. There may be overlap between isoforms, meaning that more than one isoform performs the same or similar reaction. So SIPs are a family of enzymes that are functionally conserved in all mammals, as we saw. Um, in humans, the most important phase one biotransformation enzymes are the SIPs, and there are three primary families that are involved in the majority of all drug biotransformation. These are SIP1, SIP2, and the SIP3 families. These enzymes are found in the um, ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, and the mitochondria of the liver, GI tract, kidney, as well as the skin and other organs. The liver is the most important organ in drug transformation in mammals, including both pigs and humans. So when looking at the content of these cytochromes in the liver, and this is looking at nanomoles of the protein in the fraction of liver that contains the cytochromes, also known as the microsomal fraction, per milligram of total liver protein, we can see that there are differences among the species. So in humans, there are about 0.3 nanomoles per milligram. And in the agricultural farm pigs, it, it's similar in that it's 0.22 to 0.46, but you'll see in the mini pig that it's actually more than twice what you would find in either the human or an agricultural pig. Um, and it looks like that's just what I just mentioned. Um, so the study reported here found a greater concentration of the cytochromes in mini pigs compared to agricultural pigs which we need to keep in mind when we start looking at specific studies and differences between the cytochromes. We need to keep the breed that was used for the measurement in mind when we're looking at these numbers. Not only are there breed differences in levels or amounts of the cytochromes present, but there are also polymorphisms between species and within species. There are also allelic variations leading to inter-individual variations. Some individuals may carry multiple copies of certain cytochromes. And with completion of the um, genome sequencing of the different breeds being finalized, some pseudogenes have been found in the pig for other enzymes, which are not functional within the pig, but are homologs to functional genes with, or enzymes within the human. Another source of variation in many of the published studies are not only what is measured, but the assay, how is the assay, what assay is used or how it is measured. When discussing amounts or quantities of enzyme, many papers measure mRNA via PCR. 
the PCR products may be measured using QT-PCR or RT-PCR. Levels of protein have been measured by Western Blot, ELISA, or Mass Spec, which are, all have very different um, sensitivities. And activity levels have been measured by substrate assays or using inhibition assays. Some papers look at one, some at two, and some at all three measures. There's not um, a linear correlation between the uh, RNA levels and the protein levels, nor are, is there a linear correlation, always a cor linear correlation between protein levels and activity levels. There's also evidence for post-transcriptional regulation of the enzyme. So a little more information on the activity um, level and how it's measured. In humans, these studies have been conducted by determining whether the metabolism of a specific substrate or set of substrates happens. And this is to measure whether there is a presence or absence of a specific cytochrome enzyme. Most substrate reactions are specific for a single human cytochrome. In pigs, this is not always the case, and substrates metabolized by human cytochrome 2D are metabolized by the pig cytochrome 2B family. There are other substrates that are metabolized by multiple um, pig cytochromes, whereas in the human, it's only one cytochrome. So now I'm going to talk about the common drug metabolizing enzymes found in humans and pigs. Um, in humans, there are 57 cytochromes, which are primarily in six families, and these enzymes metabolize over 90% of the drugs. In humans, three of these six families are most commonly involved in exogenous drug metabolism. The remaining families are involved in metabolism of endogenous substances. So the three families important in exogenous metabolism are the CYP1, 2, and 3, as listed here. Within each family, there are several isoforms. Each enzyme is an isoform, and they are derived from different genes. So I'm going to just go run through some of the um, common isoforms. So for the cytochrome family 1, there are two common isoforms that have over 80% sequence similarity between humans and pigs. And depending on the reference, isoform 1A, 1A1 in both humans and pigs has been reported to both have sex differences, and it's also been reported to not have sex differences. Um, and this is something that is consistent throughout the literature um, discussing these cytochromes is the lack of consistency. Um, no sex differences have been re reported in the 1A2 isoform in pigs. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just may be their methodology that was used in that paper. So this family metabolizes carcinogens, including aromatic and heterocyclic amines. It metabolizes estrogens, mycotoxins, xanthine, some antidepressants, and analgesics. Specifically, CYP1A2 has a role in metabolism of antipsychotics, caffeine, and theophylline. It's also been shown to be induced by drugs, including a normal dose of omiprazole, which is a common over-the-counter drug. Um, and this induction has been shown to be consistent across species. In humans, the CYP1A family metabolizes about 20% of the substances tested. There have been reports of activity being sex-related with higher activity in females, only in mini pigs, or in males, um, and this is human males, and it was Caucasian males. There are also changes in the amount of CYP1 as the animal ages with decreasing levels as the um, animal or human ages. The cytochrome 1B family is the predominant isoform in humans in organs outside of the liver, and this isoform has not been characterized in the mini pig. Moving to the CYP2 family, here we have many four isoforms to discuss. On the left, I have the human CYP listed with the corresponding pig um, cytochrome in the next column, and then I have a column with amino acid similarity and in the final column, I've listed any differences that have been reported in the literature. So there are sex differences in some of these cytochrome families, um, and there are also breed differences in some of them. So the CYP2 family metabolizes nicotine, nitrosamines, aflatoxin, B1. And we have thus far been talking about differences between humans and pigs, but here we have information that specifically for the 2A19 isoform, there is a difference between pig breeds, and there's a 99% similarity or homo um, between Gottingen and conventional breeds, but 
that means that there's 1% that is not homologous, and that may be um, significant. Female gotten-ins have, have shown to have a 70 time higher activity level than males for this family, but when intact males are castrated, the activity in these males increases 10 times, showing that androgen levels do affect SIP activity, but it's not completely related only to the androgens or sex hormones. Yucatan females have been reported to have a five time higher activity than males, and there have been no sex differences um, in activity reported in humans. Again, there are market species breed as well as sex differences. The CYP2B fam family metabolizes diazepam, lidocaine, cyclophosphamide, and tamoxifen. No sex differences in activity have been shown in Yucatans in this family, and levels are increased in conventional pigs relative to humans. Levels in young animals are the highest and then decrease as the animals reach adulthood. Overall, there are many inconsistencies in what is known about the CYP2B isoforms in the pig. One of the substrates commonly used for testing activity of the human cytochrome 2B family is dealkylation of 7-pentoxyresorufin. This assay was used in some of the studies examining porcine cytochromes, but was not used by all groups. There are also inconsistencies in sources of the hepatocytes, and thus differences in the microsomes that were used in these tests. Another variable is that the CYP2 family can be induced by phenobarbital and a few other drugs. In humans, the CYP2C family metabolizes 22% of drugs, including losartan, propofol, estrogens, testosterone, and methadone. In pigs, the CYP2 isoforms show cross-reactivity toward many of the test substrates, not just those for human CYP2C. And it has been proven difficult to extrapolate between the two species for this family. In the CYP2D family, this family metabolizes antidepressants, antipsychotics, as well as beta blockers. In humans, this family has high inter-individual variants with multiple polymorphisms or alleles. And this family has not been, been focused on in the pig, but what has been found is that many of the human CYP2D substrates have been found to be metabolized by the pig CYP2B family. And the final um, group in this family is the cytochrome 2E family. This family metabolizes alcohols, ketones, anesthetics, and nitrosamines. Metabolism by this family can lead to production of highly reactive toxic or carcinogenic metabolites. I think one of the more relevant and important aspects of this family is that it can be inducible by both alcohol as well as high fat diet. None of these studies that have been done in pigs that look at how these factors may affect levels or activity of this or any cytochrome family in the pig. This family can be induced by stress, by increased translation, and no change in transcription. In many pig studies have shown higher activity in females than in males. Conversely, there have been no sex differences noted in studies of the CYP2E in any of the conventional breeds that have been examined, nor have they been um, shown in humans. So in humans, there are two important CYP3 isoforms, and in pigs, there are three important isoforms. Again, both sex and breed differences have been shown in the pig for this CYP family. In humans, this family represents 30% of the total cytochromes in the liver. This family metabolizes at least 27% of exogenous substances in the human and is involved in steroid hydroxylation and converts sex hormones as well as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and pesticides. The CYP3 family is highly expressed in many organs in humans, and this is the primary family in humans. A couple of highlights are that the pig also expresses 3E, 3A excuse me, in several organs, although this family is not the primary one um, in the pig. It has been shown that transcriptional regulation is different between humans and pigs. Differences between breeds have been shown, and again, the diet can differentially affect the activity level of this cytochrome family in males and females. A study was done looking at the effect of chicory root in the diet, and it was shown that it, the presence of chicory root in the diet decreased the enzyme activity in males, whereas in females, the activity was increased. To review, there are no major differences in substrates, inducers, or inhibitors, and tissue distribution 
between humans and pigs in SIP 1A1, 1A2, and 3A. Several studies um, have shown that Gottingen mini pigs have higher content overall relative to three breeds of conventional pigs and two races of humans. Um, both content or levels of the enzyme and activities of cytochromes differ among the breeds. Significant sex differences have been shown in porcine cytochromes, but not all breeds. While sex steroids or hormones have been shown to have an effect, the sex differences are not always dependent only upon those sex hormones. There have been several studies done by Kojima et al. that have looked at several cytochromes in two different breeds as well as F1 hybrids of these two breeds. The findings have shown that there may be a positive or negative correlation with administration of testosterone, and some cytochromes are increased whereas others are decreased. The takeaway is that there are significant discrepancies in the interpretation of cytochrome levels and substrate specificities, and many of these discrepancies are due to different assays and measurement techniques being used. We've heard much about these issues in yesterday's presentations and discussions for viruses as well. These studies also show that whether a cytochrome family is inducible and the magnitude of induction differs across tissues and cell types, even when exposed to the same chemical inducer. There are similar concerns when looking at activity. Some of the studies measure activity per milligram of microsomal protein, whereas some of them look at activity per milligram of whole liver protein. These discrepancies may account for some of the differences between the sexes um, if in some breeds the females have more cytochrome enzymes overall within the liver. Some of the other variables I've mentioned briefly include genetics, both breed and parental lineage, the age of the animal. For some cytochromes, very young animals may not express a specific cytochrome, whereas for other cytochromes, the highest expression is in animals less than three months old. There are sex differences as well as sex differences with age, diet, um, factors may be more pronounced with age. There may, are also epigenetic factors to consider. Um, circadian variation has also been reported, so the time of sampling for the studies is relevant but rarely reported. Transcri transcriptional regulation is also important but poorly studied. I've included this figure to demonstrate that organs develop at different rates between pigs and humans, and with all of the variation I just reviewed, I believe it's imperative that we make sure that the organ that's being translated is mature transplanted is mature if it's going to be placed into an adult, and I think we've covered that in some of our discussions um, in the last day and a half. So the reason we're um, talking about drug metal metabolism at all is likely twofold. One, you want to make sure that the drug you're giving the patient can be metabolized appropriately by the xenograft, and two, you want to make sure that the drugs are not toxic to the xenograft. There will be many cases in which drug-drug interactions also need to be considered, but another facet that we need to consider is while the drug may not be directly toxic, it may inhibit a particular cytochrome isoform that results in toxicity from another drug that would use that inhibited um, cytochrome. I'm going to um, move quickly through the phase two conjugation um, pathways. and so. In the phase two reactions, these reactions result in the formation of covalent linkage between a functional group and either glucuronic acid, sulfate, glutathione, amino acids, or acetate, and this will increase the polarity of a compound to aid in excretion. In most species, glucuronidation and sulfation are most important covalent reactions in drug biotransformation. But not as much research has been done on the phase two um, and uh, enzymes so far in the pig. It is known, however, that sulfate conjugation in swine is slower than in other species, and that to offset this, other reactions predominate in the pig, whereas sulfation is more predominant in humans. It turns out in the pig, um, the pig is more efficient than the human at glucuronidation, and so will glucuronidate um, in place of adding a sulfate in many cases. As I just mentioned, pigs compensate by using other phase two enzymes to metabolize, um, and pigs also have a high acetylating capability. In the pig, not mo much is known about the UGT or its isoforms other than the fact that it is more um, efficient than the human. So 
I am going to go through the organ systems um, right now and just talk about what is known in the pig. So I'm just going to touch on the liver, GI, and kidney. And so starting with the liver, there are numerous influx and efflux transporters. This slide represents a human hepatocyte, and it's from a review in 2010, so 12 years ago. The transporters in blue are known transporters, but they are not, were not thought to be of much importance in drug metabolism. Then in a review from the same group in 2018, um, you can see that they have added more transporters that they're aware of, um, ones that they didn't think were important, now they think are, which is represented by the color, color change. And the point of showing this is that in eight years, the study of the most important drug metabolizing organ in humans has led to advances in new knowledge, and there's funding to support studies like this. Um, until there's a group of toxicologists and pathologists that can systematically examine the pig, I think we're lagging far behind in basic scientific knowledge for this species. So the liver performs primary or pre-systemic extraction with the receipt of the portal blood flow. There are both phase one and phase two enzymes in the liver. The porcine liver contains similar levels of glutathione transferase and UDP glucuronosyl transferase to the human. Overall, the quantity of the isoforms are quite different between the two species within the liver. This shows the protein levels, which is picomoles per milligram of microsomes in the pig on the left and in the human on the right. In the pig, the most abundant protein is the CYP2A19 followed by 2D25 and 2E1. In humans, the most abundant protein is CYP3A followed by 2C25, 1A1, and 2E1. So you can see that there are profound differences in the liver of the cytochromes. Moving on to the intestine, again, just showing you that in 2010, these are the um, transporters that they were aware of and thought were important. Those circled in green in this slide are actually have higher levels in the pig. Um, if they're in red, they had lower levels, and gray had similar levels. So that's just a comparison between the two species. So you, again, you can see there are different levels of the transporters in the intestine. In 2018, there are more transporters that the um, group discovered and thought were important. Um, so in the GI tract, passive cellular diffusion is the primary mechanism of intestinal drug absorption and other variables to consider are that there are profound interspecies differences in the level of salivary amylase, the pH of the stomach, small and large intestines, the rate of gastric emptying, GI transit time also differs between species, and the age of the animal again matters when discussing drug, drug absorption and metabolism. The GI tract is the most important extrahepatic site of drug biotransformation. And most molecules pass through the enterocytes after oral administration. In both pigs and humans, CYP3A is the most abundant biotransforming enzyme in the small intestine. And overall, pigs do have similar um, gut physiology to humans. Other factors to consider in the GI tract are the efflux transporters, which I discussed previously, bile salts that solubilize the lipophilic drugs, and the bile flow similarity um, between is similar between humans and pigs. And here is a, another figure showing the um, cytochromes um, in the uh, jejunum between the pig on the left and the human on the right. And you can see in the jejunum, at least, there is more similarity um, between the cytochromes. Finally, let's talk about the kidney. The kidney does have some drug metabolizing capability, and this figure should be starting to look familiar. Here it is in 2010. Again, in 2018, you can see that the transporter number has increased. Um, and without doubt, whether or not the kidney contributes to metabolism, it is the most important organ for elimination of drugs and their metabolites. Of the most commonly used therapeutics, the approximately one-third will undergo elimination through the kidney. As far as metabolism, the kidney only has one-tenth of the cytochrome expression as does the liver, although in some cases its metabolic activity may surpass the liver, depending on the drug. Within the kidney, there is, are regional differences in regard to enzyme levels, and the metabolism of drugs occurs primarily within the proximal tubules. 
So substrates and inhibitors of renal transporters are well documented in the human, and studies looking at cytochromes in the kidney are rare. In a few studies looking at other species, it has been shown that the rabbit, um, that in the rabbit, the S2 and S3 segments are enriched in cytochrome levels, and in the rabbit, there are sex differences um, in the liver, but they're not evident in the kidney. And I mentioned that some cytochromes may be induced in the liver, and this is also true in the kidney, but there are differences. In some cases, the same drug will induce um, cytochromes in both organs, or in some cases, the drug is organ SIP inducing specific. So barbiturates would induce cytochromes in the liver, but not in the kidney, whereas polycyclic hydrocarbons will induce cytochromes in both the liver and the kidney. It's going to be difficult to extrapolate findings in other species to the pig if the studies are not done in pigs. Of note, um, large differences have been noted in the renal metabolism between mice and rats, and they are more closely related than humans and pigs. There was one study in China where they attempted to cause acute kidney injury with a drug. Not only were the results of the study inconsistent between groups, they were inconsistent between individual individuals. There remains much to learn about the kidney reaction to drugs in the pig and renal metabolism of drugs in the pig. In humans, the kidney expresses a 3A isoform, um, but levels of the cytochrome vary by race with Africans expressing highest levels and Caucasians the lowest. Um, and this is relevant as nephrotoxicity of cyclosporin and tacrolimus, two commonly used drugs in immunosuppression, is dependent upon the 3A5 genotype. There are similar processes and pathways between the two species, but levels of the enzyme and rate of metabolism may differ between and even within the species. Um, Dr. Helka, we, we will want to leave a few minutes uh, for questions. Okay. Um, I, let me make two more points. Um, I'm just going to apologize to the vegans and vegetarians, but the bottom line is that most of the original work has been done in the pig examining drug metabolism and cytochromes stems from the fact that um, agricultural side has had an interest in making pork more palatable. Many initial studies looked at porcine cytochromes to de de decrease boar taint, and um, breed differences emerged as some of the studies um, showed. And then I'm just going to skip through all of this. Um, you guys have the slide deck for your um, perusal. There are holes in knowledge. And then at the end, I have placed some value-added slides here for the committee to consider in their deliberations. I'm not going to go through them, but would recommend that the background lesion in xenotransplant models be examined systematically as it has been in these mini pig breeds used in toxicology studies. They're all findings from the control animals in toxicology studies. And I'll also mention that the finding, finding the funding to do these studies is difficult. With the slides I have provided, the tissues were collected and processed as part of a study for toxicology, but funding to do this de novo needs to be considered in order to see what sort of background pathology may be present in a population of potential xenotransplant pigs. Thank you, and I'll end there, and I'm sorry I went over. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Helka. Um, so we do have a couple minutes for uh, questions while I watch for hands from the committee. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask. So it seems that you know, as you've shown, there's a lot of biochemistry and drug metabolism that's you know either known or anticipated to be very different between pigs and humans, um, and uh, and more so between you know what could be a considerable variation from one human being to another. And perhaps um, as uh, sponsors think about the engineering that they propose in the uh, porcine hosts for these organs, um, perhaps basing the strain choice in part on what's known about the metabolic um, changes would be valuable? I think so. And the, the problem is that, I mean, even between the breeds, there's inconsistencies in the literature right now as it stands. So. I mean, if you look at one study that compares pigs to humans, then their methodology is going to be the same throughout that paper, which is great. But it's difficult to compare from one group of scientists to another because they don't necessarily use the same, like I said, methodologies. Um, but yeah, there are individual differences in humans as well. But I, I think it is something that's going to have to be considered. And 
like I said when I started my talk, is that, you know, Dr. Wolf did mention the differences in breeds and the growth rates, um, but I've had a hard time finding, you know, I see all these papers on the xenotransplants, and it says there was a genetically modified pig used. But what I can't find is what breed was that. Yeah, that's important. I'm, I'm, one of the things we talked about yesterday was an opportunity for some consortia efforts um, to help propose standards. And so do you think that there's an opportunity here in some of these uh, biochemical and enzymatic type studies? Oh, absolutely. I think there needs to be um, so that they're doing, I mean, you want to keep up with the science, and I understand that some of these papers were probably done in the 80s, and yes, science has advanced. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we can't, like, redo a couple of those to see is that consistent or has this new methodology changed the outcome or our interpretation of the outcome. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, because the SIPs are so critical uh, to drug metabolism and, and some of the drugs that, you know, are key to the clinical situations we're talking about, um, you know, is, is there a short list of things that you would prioritize for measurements or would that be just very hard to think about? Uh, well, I think it's hard because you've got so many of them that overlap. You know, it may be one step that does this reaction in the human, but in the pig, that reaction is metabolized by two steps that aren't neither one of which are the same as the one that's in the human. Are these studies that can be done in vitro? They're, most of them are done in vitro. They take liver samples and then isolate the microsomes. You know, one thing I didn't get to mention is that a lot of these are isolating microsomes, which is essentially the ER, but that leaves the mitochondrial aspect out. And there was a recent paper done in rats showing that you've got SIPs both in the mitochondria and in the ER. And so if you're only looking at the microsomes, you're looking at the ER, you're leaving that whole mitochondrial component out. You know, so maybe the better way to do it is to look at whole liver. I, I'm not sure. You know, and some of the studies do look at whole liver, and that's, maybe that's why there are differences. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, definitely going to factor into our discussion on question six. Um, any final questions from other members of the committee? Um, um, Dr. Bloom. Yes, um, that's a really uh, presentation can only be described as a cornucopia of uh, detail. And uh, I'm just kind of, I'd just be sort of curious to hear um, what Dr. Pearson and Dr. Wolf's reaction uh, to all that was. I mean, the, you talked a lot about the kidney, the transporters, and stuff like that. But I'm curious what they're feeling about this and, and how much of what you talk about is something that they take into consideration or think about when they do their studies. Thanks. Okay, I'm not, I don't know if we can uh, call on them now, if they're easy to call on, or if we should um, ask them to be ready to perhaps respond to that question when we have the full committee discussion. That, that would be fine. That would be fine. Okay, why don't we do that? Um, then, um, again, I'll, I'll thank you, Dr. Helka, for that presentation. Um, and now we are scheduled for a, a short break before we go into uh, the long discussion of both questions five and six. So um, let's come back in 15 minutes. We're scheduled for 10. Let's come back in 15, refreshed, and uh, all ready to weigh in um, on both of these questions. Thank you very much. All right, studio, if you can uh, take us to break.
Welcome back to FDA's 73rd meeting of the Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee meeting. That was our last break. I'm going to hand it back to our chair, Dr. Lisa Butterfield. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, and now we've had uh, two presentations about our last two questions for today about xenotransplantation. So um, now let's move to discussion of question five. We'll have two discussants to present uh, their views and to start the discussion ball rolling, and then we'll move to uh, full committee comments, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, from uh, most of the members of the committee on this. So question five is transplantation of pig cells and organs is intended to provide replacement for non-functioning damaged human cells and organs. Therefore, it's important to understand the characteristics of these cells or organs in the pig to ensure they have the characteristics needed to provide replacement therapy for the human recipient before transplantation. And it is important to monitor these cells and organs to demonstrate they provide the expected functions after transplantation. Please discuss existing data to address the following issues related to pig cells and organs intended for transplantation into humans, so both before and after transplant. Um, A, the ability of the target pig organ to support full organ function in humans, and B, the natural aging of the target organ in the pig expected, uh, relevant to expected organ function over time in humans. So uh, organ function, and uh, function over time. So our two discussants uh, are Dr. Zeiss and Pilevsky. So Dr. Zeiss, please start us off. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. And uh, thank you, Dr. Beeston and Dr. Helter, Helga for um, setting the stage. And all that toxicology, it certainly makes me want to live a healthier lifestyle. Um, I want to address in some more detail the issue of overgrowth of the donor organ, because this is not a benign phenomenon. Um, the pathology is fairly significant, and it's independent of rejection-associated pathology. So we've heard from previous speakers that you know, the pig has a very strong intrinsic capacity for growth. You know, pigs are production animals. They've been bred for a long time to grow fast and very big, and that is reflected in the capacity of their organs to do the same. Uh, we see from pig-to-pig -pig allograft experiments that this is associated with breed, and it is an intrinsic capacity. Um, we've also, I also had the same experience as Dr. Helke, that trying to find the pig breeds that are used for the creation of genetically altered pigs, it's very difficult to find this. And I, I'm sure that there are people here who know what these major breeds are, but they are not well reported in the literature. Um, I, I do think that even if we use some of the smaller breeds, some of that potential for intrinsic growth capacity is going to be retained because the ancestral strains are still these production breeds. Um, when you put a pig to a baboon, I'm a kidney, there are some reports on that, on those xeno, on those xeno grafts, the, the kidneys grow very quickly. So approximately, they double their size in about three months. And that is not a benign phenomenon. It's associated with a progressive increase in creatinine. Um, and on explantation and histology, there are ischemic lesions in the kidney associated with intracellular edema and fibrosis. When it comes to hearts, you see very much the same thing. So a very quick doubling, two to three times the size of the original size of the heart, um, accompanied by biventricular hypertrophy and poor cardiac function, and on histology, myocardial hypertrophy and necrosis, interstitial edema and fibrosis as well as a microangiopathy. And these are the animals that have previously been referred to. These die within 30 days. So in the same study, um, this was Langdon, 2018, uh, this was overcome by taking a three-pronged approach. The first uh, was based on the rationale that pig blood pressure is slightly lower than non-human private blood pressure. And I think that that may be the case in some studies. However, if you look at multiple papers looking at reference values for pigs, um, in adult pigs, they are pretty much the same as people in the 120 over 80 range. Um, there is some variation. So their, their first approach was to give antihypertensives. The second was to taper prednisolone sooner, um, because prednisolone also has a tropic effect. And the third, which I think turned out to be possibly the most important intervention, was to use an mTOR antagonist. 
So mTOR is quite central to cardiac hypertrophy. It's shown in rat studies, um, in hypertensive rats, that the central mechanism to um, engaging the heart in a hypertrophic response is mTOR, then if you block that, you can block that response. Um, we also see hypertrophy of the heart in allografts. So this is not restricted to xenografts. It is a complication of cardiac allografts as well. Um, and there is evidence to suggest that extrinsic factors such as hypertension may play a role. And I think with the pig xenografts, the combination of the intrinsic capacity of the heart to grow very fast combined with extrinsic factors such as hypertension, which are likely to be very common comorbidities in transplanted patients, that these two could have a very strong synergistic effect. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Baltimore patient. So this individual was transplanted with um, a 10 gene edited pig heart, and this included the growth hormone receptor deficiency. Um, so uh, one of our previous speakers talked about preventing this hypertrophic response in pig to baboon xenografts by transplanting um, organs that had the growth hormone receptor deficiency and, and that that took care of the problem. And so I think that in the baboons it did. However, um, in the patients in Baltimore that was transplanted with one of these growth hormone receptor deficient hearts, that did not solve the problem. So this individual was hypertensive um, and he experienced progressive biventricular hypertrophy throughout his 60-day course of survival. Um, when the heart was examined after he had died, it had doubled in weight, and it had very similar lesions to what we see in the monkeys, so cardiac uh, myocyte necrosis, edema, and um, some evidence of um, humoral-mediated uh, rejection. So there, there was some evidence of rejection there. You know, the question has come up, what is the role of CMV? What is the mechanism? We know it's reproducible that having CMV in the patient decreases longevity of the transplant. Um, however, the, the mechanism is not entirely defined. Um, and I, I think certainly it's reasonable to assume that it engages um, the immune system and that it contributes to graft projection, but there was certainly no evidence of CMV, classic CMV-associated pathology in this heart. Um, so the use of mTOR, so, so in terms of the mechanisms that create the hypertrophy, uh, growth hormone um, is one, it's fairly upstream, mTOR is fairly downstream, and it connects with um, all kinds of upstream mediators, upstream trophic mediators, and then it connects downstream with many, many signaling pathways. And so um, trying to you know, I had asked a question earlier about could we conditionally knock that out. If, if that could be feasible, it may be one way to prevent the patient from being an mTOR inhibitor for the rest of their life. Um, but I think that we need to do more research to understand the, the, the mechanisms of controlling this hypertrophic response because it is not a benign response. Um, and I think that it, it certainly in, in the Baltimore patient, it seem to be a very significant factor in loss of the tissue. Um, Dr. Beeston very, very nicely set out all of the differences in, I'm going to switch, leave that topic behind and switch now um, to a couple of comments about the kidney, about physiologic differences. I don't really have anything to add to those that Dr. Beeston listed. Um, I will just say that it, with xenotransplants and baboons, we have seen good GFR, good urine output, good urine SG retention, and uh, normal serine creatinine for three months afterwards. Pink kidneys tend to concentrate urine a little less, um, so the urine is a little bit more dilute. There are a number of mechanisms behind that. Part of it is the anatomy. There are fewer long nephrons. Um, they don't respond to human ADH quite as well. They have a slightly lower albumin. And certainly pigs, um, baboons with pig kidneys can experience uh, episodes of hypovolemia that require um, fluid supplementation. Pigs have got a higher serum phosphorus that is quite significantly higher than people, um, about 8.6 milligrams per deciliter compared to 3 to 4.5 in people. And that certainly, I think, could create some um, complications with calcium phosphorus balance. 
Um, but that certainly in the short term has not been seen in baboons. I want to make a couple comments on hepatic xenotransplantation. Um, one of the major roadblocks there is that we still get profound thrombocytopenia. Um, so this is due to capture of recipient platelets by pig copper cells. In terms of xylit xenotransplantation, um, the hitch there is that there is um, inconsistent efficacy. And um, these may be superseded at some point by human stem cell approaches. And then lastly, I wanted to talk in the second question, um, the, the expected aging trajectory of transplanted pig kidneys. So there isn't a lot of data on old pigs out there because they're food animals. Um, we do see some data on geriatric micro mini pigs, um, so pet pigs. Um, and they generally have the usual sort of array of not very interesting, not very pathogenic things that all of us get. Uh, I wanted to pick out two that I thought could be relevant. Um, the first is the kidney. There is a relatively high proportion of interstitial fibrosis and glomerular sclerosis with aging, and this occurs pretty much across all species. Um, however, if you combine this with potentially a hypertensive recipient, um, that could certainly accelerate this propensity. Um, and then in terms of the arterial system, you do see some arterial thickening in the aorta, some intimal proliferation, um, some medial mineralization, and I will point out that pigs are fairly atherosensitive. So many species are not. Um, most animals have really quite pristine blood vessels by the time they die, and that is very different from humans. Um, it is likely that pig blood vessels, arteries, will probably experience the same pathology, um, depending on the person's lifestyle um, that ours do. So all to say that these organs are going into people often with complicated comorbidities. And the impact of those comorbidities on the implanted organs is something that we have no data on because a balloon simply don't have those comorbidities. So I think that is something that um, it might be something that just needs to wait to get human data on to fully understand that. I, I think the take home point that I, that I have seen from reading these papers is that there are quite unexpected things that happen that are quite difficult to predict um, from looking at pig to baboon studies. Um, I'll finish off by saying the transgenes, these may have altered expression over time, and this may be tissue specific. And so we could accumulate um, tendency for rejection or coagulopathy over time. And I think with that, I will stop. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Seif. Um, and now our second discussant, uh, Dr. Polevsky. So um, I, I'm going to focus on uh, the kidney since I'm a nephrologist, and I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Zeiss, uh, Dr. Beeston, and Dr. Helke for their uh, really setting the, the stage here. Um, when we talk about support, having uh, a kidney supporting um, uh, human life, we normally focus on the filtration aspect of kidney function, GFR, um, controlling uh, BUN and creatinine, but the kidney is a far more complex organ than just one that uh, excretes uh, uh, um, nitrogenous waste products. Um, and this was touched on by uh, Dr. Beeston in terms of issues related to uh, fluid and blood pressure control, electrolyte balance, um, et cetera, the, the kidney um, has uh, complex transporter function, um, and I could find very little on uh, data on homology between uh, pig transporters and uh, human transporters, um, which may have uh, important significance in terms of uh, sensitivity to the drugs that we typically use, such as diuretics, um, uh, thiazides affecting the, the 
um, sodium chloride transporter in the distal convoluted tubule um, and uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, loop diuretics acting on the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter. So are these drugs going to function um, in similar fashion? Um, uh, electrolyte disturbances are frequently seen following allotransplantation. Hyperkalemia is a common problem. Phosphate wasting is a, is a common problem. Um, uh, we'll have to uh, find out what happens um, with the uh, uh, pig kidneys in individuals who've had longstanding chronic kidney disease who may have underlying uh, severe secondary uh, hyperparathyroidism. Um, what are the differences in the renin angiotensin system in the pig compared to the, um, the human? Um, uh, erythropoietin. Um, uh, there is a lack of homology um, and uh, ineffectiveness of uh, uh, the pig uh, erythropoietin on erythrogenesis, but um, is there enough homology that this is going to trigger um, an antibody response that could then result in um, uh, resistance to erythropoietin um, and uh, uh, pure red cell aplasia? From, uh, from this and do, will we have uh, to deal with, um, with that as a, as a longer term um, uh, consequence. Um, uh, with regard to um, aging, uh, comments have already been made about the uh, growth of the kidney um, and uh, this uh, poses a significant risk. You're not going to be increasing nephron number so as you have renal growth, you're going to have hyperfiltration. Um, how is that going to affect uh, uh, the development of uh, glomerular sclerosis and early uh, demise of the kidney due to um, non-immunologic injury? Um, so I think that we have a, a tremendous number of unknowns that are going to need to be very well defined um, in order to move forward with clinical um, use of, of xenotransplants. So I think that, that we need a lot of research to define um, these issues before we can move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So, um, you know, and I think uh, to add to what our two discussants have just uh, presented after our two presentations, um, we also uh, heard um, uh, a little bit yesterday on, you know, the notion that, um, you know, young organs are being transplanted and over time um, it's possible that there might be a second organ that needs to be um, transplanted. Um, uh, the notion of, um, you know, uh, donor uh, animal testing could be, you know, imaging before transplant, um, but it looks like there's a lot of depth lacking in um, in some of the measures of function that we've been able to collect data on so far. So let me uh, turn to the committee and um, let's discuss these in more detail and we'll start with Dr. Morrison. I've got a question about this phenomenon of organ growth. Um, to what extent, it sounds like there's both inflammation and edema that contributes to the increased size of the organ, as well as a growth capacity in the heart and the kidney that we don't see in the human heart and kidney. So is it known that there are stem cells in the adult pig heart and kidney, and if so, does this growth continue throughout adult life? All right, thanks for that question. Uh, let's see what we do know about that mechanism. Looking for hands of who would like to uh, address that intrinsic organ growth. Uh, Dr. Zeiss, thank you. Um, so, so, First of all, there is, there is very little inflammation in these organs. There is no cellular infiltrate. What we see is cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So these are existing cardiomyocytes. They're not proliferating, 
they're the existing ones that are getting bigger, and then they're dying. Um, that's what we see in the monkeys. It's what we see in the Baltimore patient. Um, Pigs, pigs do keep growing <laughs> quite quite a while after sexual maturity. So sows will, will accumulate 50 to 100 pounds with every litter. Um, you know, the rationale behind creating the growth hormone pigs, growth hormone receptor division pigs, was that they would be past their growth curve to produce a heart that was of a size for an adult human, but they, they would be past their growth curve. And so that residual growth would not keep on. Um, the problem with, with mini pigs is that they tend to have high perves, but we've heard that there are ways around that. So the question is, do we create growth hormone receptor deficient mini pigs, um, assuming that there are other metabolic associated with uh, abnormalities associated with that, um, and then harvest those organs, which are still going to have some intrinsic growth capacity. Um, I think at some point, if you, if you take enough measures to limit growth, um, you can mitigate that intrinsic capacity for growth. However, the extrinsic capacity, extrinsic drivers like hypertension are still going to be there. So there has to be some way to control that as well, um, possibly through controlling mTOR and controlling hypertension, which is obviously not always very easy. But like for the intrinsic growth capacity, that is just that the heart grows a little bit longer than in a human, but that that growth does end at some point in terms of the oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it will end. And and will will um, mTOR inhibition still help with the size of the heart once that growth capacity, the intrinsic growth capacity is over, or is that the only thing that's targeted by mTOR inhibition? So mTOR is a mechanism in um, pathologic left ventricular hypertrophy associated with hypertension. So, so this is a, the the enlargement in the size of the heart is a combination of intrinsic growth and pathologic hypertrophy, and it's difficult to disentangle which of those is driving this. Certainly, the intrinsic growth is a major component, but the extrinsic amplification of this is also important. Is it possible to just harvest the hearts from a little bit older pigs once they've gotten past that intrinsic growth phase? Yep, so that was the rationale be, behind the growth hormone receptor deficient pigs. So these are German Landrace. It's still a production breed. It's still pretty big. Um, those pigs are about 60 to 70 percent of the size. The heart is about 75 percent of the size of um, a regular production pig heart. So it's still a pretty big heart. Um, you know, if we shift again, you know, what breed is going to be optimal for this? I, I think that's a question that hasn't been answered yet. If we shift all of the genetic alterations to a smaller pig, um, then potentially we could get over that major growth curve and find a heart that has got far less intrinsic capacity to grow. Thank you. All right, thank you both for that. Uh... So, um... Let's see. Um, let's hear um, more discussion on question five from committee members. Uh, let's go next to uh, Dr. Ockenkloss and then uh, Dr. Cooper. I was simply going to go back to Marshall Bloom's question and ask our morning presenters what their reaction was to the, the afternoon presentations. Um, I'll see if we have them available. Um, Sometimes uh, guest presenters who are not committee members end up um, moving to YouTube uh, to continue to watch the proceedings. Um, I'll ask no, if they're not here. Okay. All right. So I don't think we can. Um, I don't think we can call on them. Um, but let me go on to to my other observation or comment that was on Thank my you. mind, which was, uh, would my fellow committee members agree that the two tissues that are probably best to start with for xenotransplantation would be heart and eyelids? Does that make sense? Oh, there's Robin Pearson. 
I'm sorry, it took me a, mild, a moment to get to the right screen. I apologize for putting my hand up again. I've been told I'm not supposed to do that, but I thank you for the call out. Thank um, you. The, I wanted to uh, start by the Dr. Zytel's point, uh, points are right on. The complicating factor in the Maryland Heart case, the case of the Maryland Heart recipient, is complicated by the CMV activation, which may have triggered uh, inflammation in the graft uh, that could have contributed to diastolic dysfunction and hypertrophy independent of the mTOR, uh, independent of the growth hormone receptor knockout. And so that situation is difficult to fully interpret. Um, the mTOR inhibitor's effect on growth in the German orthotopic heart experience, uh, it, in my estimation, it's not clear whether it's an, uh, an effect to inhibit growth to suppress elicited immunity or both that accounts for the salutary um, uh, attenuation of growth uh, out of proportion to the physiological needs of the recipient uh, in that model. And I think we won't know until we try this in human heart recipients with, to what extent hypertension control alone, mTOR inhibition added to whatever immunosuppression uh, is considered the platform uh, or both will be necessary and sufficient to prevent pathologic remodeling, uh, diastolic dysfunction, hypertrophy of uh, either uh, non-growth hormone receptor knockout or growth hormone receptor knockout um, organs in the, in the human circumstance. Coming back to the uh, more general question that Hugh asked about my reflections on these talks, uh, which are very interesting and educational for me, about the many differences between pigs and humans and uh, the many unknowns about pig renal physiology. There is grant funding from NIH right now that's coming to my colleague David Cooper at, uh, at MGH asking about some of these aspects of renal, potentially clinically important aspects of renal function, erythropoietin metabolism, uh, pituitary uh, parathyroid hormone metabolism, uh, and other facets related to uh, salt retention, blood pressure regulation, et cetera. Angiotensin pathway is, of course, also quite important that are unknowns. The reassuring aspect to me is that when we prevent pathologic elicited immunity and also, uh, at least in the heart circumstance, inhibit dysregulated coagulation, those organs grow to the size of the donor pig and then at adult size and then seem to stop. And anecdotally, we have a heart that's nine months out uh, after transplant. It does have the uh, growth hormone receptor knocked out. And without blood pressure control, without any effort to modulate blood pressure, that heart has stopped growing and is not to demonstrate either diastolic dysfunction or uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So there are going, I, I can cite a, an example where we didn't need to control blood pressure and we ended up with uh, a pig heart in a baboon that is the right size for the pig it came from. And I think that's the message of Dr. Kawai's study as well, that the pig organs will grow, will try to grow to the same size as the adult of the species from which they come. If there is immunologic injury or physiologic damage, either to, due to too high blood pressure, as Dr. Zytel was referring to, or some other uh, pathology, uh, then one can expect that the organ will adversely remodel in one way or another. Um, and so uh, that would, my takeaway from those important observations and acknowledging the many unknowns is that our preclinical data would predict that the kidney and the heart are likely to be life-supporting when tested in humans. And if that is not the case, we will learn that relatively early and how far back to the drawing boards that will send us, I can't predict until we see what kind of trouble we get into. But I'm, I, my own judgment is that the place for us to learn that is in the clinic and that I'm sufficiently optimistic, as I told our patient advocate earlier today, that I personally feel that it is 
reasonable to move forward uh, in a in a uh, as safe a way as we can. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. All right. Thank you both. Um, anything else for now, Dr. Uh, Aachen Kloss? Looks like no. No, let's let some others weigh in. Right, thank you. Um, let's move to Dr. Cooper. So, so thank you. Um, so I, I will let it be known I had my hand raised before Dr. Pearson jumped on the call, and that was extremely helpful. He may have started to answer a question that I had that I'm not sure if I'm the only one thinking it. I would say our afternoon speakers gave really a uh, intriguing, outstanding, um, I think we said cornucopia uh, of information around sort of functional, mechanistic, and physiologic differences between you know, porcine and, and human hearts and kidneys, um, especially. And I, I, I wanted to challenge Dr. Pavleski at the end of his presentation said that, you know, we, we just don't know and we're going to need to be able to do more experiments to test these things. And I'm after two days, I'm sort of struck by the, the frequency with which pretty much everyone who has either presented or commented has said that the only way they were going to know is to move into clinical trials. And I guess I'm, I'm uncertain, short of that model, how are we going to answer those questions? And, and I, I'm reflecting back on the, the most recent uh, FDA sort of guidance on this that was, was you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that was certainly rigid in its expectation that in order to move to clinical trials, the expectation at that time was that there needed to be a robust um, non-human primate model with um, consistent immunosuppression that demonstrated success before the FDA would approve to move on to clinical trials. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm uncertain, but I'm hoping sort of based upon a lot of this conversation that we are perhaps sort of changing that view back from 2016, because it seems as if many of us on this call, including, again, our experts, and I, I thank them all for their presentations and, and being able to answer our questions, seem to concur that we are at a point where we feel confident that we can move forward safely, but we are going to need in a very careful model answer a lot of these questions and continue in an iterative process to determine you know, how can we make this model better? But I, I just want to be certain that we are on a similar page or in a similar place that we keep saying clinical um, trials are, are now appropriate, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can agree to that. Thank you. Yes, we've, we have heard um, some specifics around the limitations of, of non-human primate models and questions we cannot ask in them. All right, we have some hands, uh, Dr. Kimmel, then Dr. Polevsky, uh, then Dr. Fishman, please. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually dying to hear Dr. Polevsky's answer to Dr. Cooper. Um, but I did want to uh, ask, uh, I was hoping that Dr. Auchincloss could comment on why he thinks that kidneys should be later in the queue than hearts. I mean, there's some advantages in kidney transplantation. If they fail, patient can be treated with dialysis. But with heart transplantation, it's sort of an ultimate uh, effort. And uh, I think uh, we're probably as ready to go forward with kidney transplantation studies as heart transplantation. Um, so could you adumbrate on that, Dr. Rockenkloss? Okay, his hand is up. Why don't we have that response, and then we'll um, go on to Dr. Polevsky. I think you've got the order out of sequence here. I think you're supposed yep. to go back to Dr. Auchincloss. Yes, and then Polevsky and then Fishman, please. Well, I, I'm very interested in your comments there, and you're right. Of course, there is a fallback position for the kidney. I will upset my cardiac friends if I say that the heart's a pretty stupid organ and the kidney is much more complicated, and therefore maybe we ought to stick with the organ that doesn't have such complicated functions to it. But cardiac surgeons might disagree with that. Um, and islets, as I mentioned before, I, I think we really have good evidence that pig insulin can be secreted and regulated physiologically. I just think that the kidney is a pretty complicated organ. 
Well, I take that with a lot of respect, and we should never insult our cardiovascular colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, wanna, I do want to make sure we're staying focused on um, the, the functional questions uh, that were being asked uh, currently in question five um, about the data um, supporting organ function, regardless of, of which of those organs uh, we're talking about. So anything else on that uh, on that topic, or uh, should we move to uh, Dr. Polevsky? So thank you, thank, Matt. Thanks for the the, the comments. I I'm not suggesting that we need to spend years doing pig physiology research. I think that some of the questions about transporters and about um, uh, the uh, uh, the tubular uh, physiology and the endocrine physiology can probably be answered very rapidly, knowing the um, uh, pig that is going, the, the pig species that's going to be used. And I think much of the data will have to be um, gathered in real time as we start doing um, uh, in human uh, transplants. Um, so I, I'm not. I, I wasn't suggesting that this should be a, a, a years-long barrier to proceeding with uh, 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 clinical trials. All right. Thank you for addressing that. Um, and Dr. Fishman, your hand had been up earlier. Did you want to weigh in um, next? Sure. Thank you. Um, just a comment, again, to try to put it in the context a little bit of allotransplantation, because in humans, I found these data, the metabolic data, very interesting. In humans, there's a five-fold variance in um, CYP metabolism, and we see that and compensate for it based on drug levels. And so we track immunosuppressive drug levels, for example, and we titrate those not based only on levels, but we titrate them to effect. So if they are toxic for the kidney, for example, or we do a biopsy, or if we have graft rejection, or we activate infection. So that I only say that because although these metabolic functions, I think, are very important, and the response to immuno immunosuppressant agents are going to be very important, it is a part of something that we do routinely in allotransplantation already in many ways. And I think the only way to address that uh, is, as Matt Cooper said, is in clinical trials. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer those or predict what's going to happen. And in an individual, we can't predict what their metabolic framework is going to be either. So the, the meshing of the pig metabolism and the human metabolism is an experiment. And uh, I think we're going to need clinical trials to unravel that. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to move now to Dr. Wu. So I have a question about the long-term use of uh, immunosuppression in these uh, pig heart transplants. Um, I think, as you know, for most uh, elbow transplants, after six months or a year, you can kind of paper off some of these uh, heavy immunosuppressive uh, regimen. For these xenotransplants, is that the expectation, or you cannot uh, do that in the sense that for xenotransplant, the immunosuppression is always going to be very heavy throughout the whole course of uh, the organ being in the human body? And if that's the case, what is the long-term consequence of that on the other uh, organs that are uh, being uh, heavily affected by these immunosuppression? So I just want to get the expert thoughts on whether there's any possibility for tapering some of these medications after a while, or that's not possible. All right, thank you, Dr. Wu. I will watch for hands of who would like to address uh, that taper of immune suppression uh, question. Um, so let's go to, um, I see a hand up from, uh, from Richard, our guest. Uh, from uh, Dr. Pearson, thank you. At the moment, we have very little data upon which to uh, judge this. 
What I can say, there are two points I'd like to raise. One is that the co-stimulation pathway blocking immunosuppression is associated with absence of viral reactivation, suggesting that it's less globally immunosuppressive than our conventional approach of calcineurin inhibitor plus MMF plus steroids as the most common regimen. <clears throat> it is uh, the only data that we have about tapering immunosuppression would suggest that if you turn off immunosuppression at six months, that the graph will reject after that. So the animals are not tolerant at six months. If you wait to a year and a half or two years before dialing down the intensity of the co-stimulation pathway blockade, the time to initiation of immunologic injury uh, as measured by anti-pig antibody and subsequently by graft injury is significantly delayed with respect relative to earlier, uh, earlier cessation of therapy. And in at least one of Muhammad's exper uh, experimental animals, turning down the immunosuppression at something like 300 days and keeping it there for another year uh, was well tolerated. So we're not gonna know the answer to your question until we have substantial clinical experience. But as Dr. Fishman just mentioned, what we currently do in our patients is to titrate therapy based on uh, efficacy and side effects. And with the, the beauty of co-stimulation in our preclinical models at least, is that you can give a lot of antibody, and we don't know yet what the appropriate target uh, drug level is, a, a circulating antibody, a therapeutic antibody level is that is sufficient to suppress the immune response. But we can measure it, and we can then compare groups with different targets and learn from our patients how much is enough. One of the concerns in Xeno is that, to date, when we see elicited immunity to a xenograft, graft failure almost always happens, and there's nothing that I know of that we currently do in our non-human primates that is able to abort that response. That is a concern for any clinical trialist. It is possible that the same treatments that we use in our patients who develop anti-donor antibody, that uh, proteasome inhibitors and intensified immunosuppression will be sufficient to reverse that immune response, an antibody elicited immune response in patients. We can't very well test that in our non-human primates because the complications associated with those aggressive interventions are simply not work, can't, you cannot manage those complications and it's uh, not humane for the animal subjects to be put through that kind of a, uh, a regimen. <clears throat> On the other hand, our human patients, we can talk through the options with them and get their consent to do something experimental that might in fact rescue them. So that's one of the ways in which a clinical trial offers us opportunities that we cannot pursue to learn and potentially to make significant progress in the clinic where we can't do it preclinically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, I think we're moving sort of between questions five and six at this point because this is you know, in, in part sort of a holistic discussion. So I propose that we move to discussion question six, have those um, two discussions present, um, and then um, let's have some discussion around that, uh, and then I'll sum up and we'll check in um, with our uh, regulatory colleagues uh, after that. So um, given that, so our last question, question six, Transplanted pig organs are likely to be exposed to a variety of drugs that were not routinely used in the donor animals. Such drugs could include products to treat the patient's underlying medical conditions, diabetes, hypertension, as well as drugs like immunosuppressants intended to ensure the success of the transplant. Um, and then I know we've got some other folks uh, on uh, mic. Um, so the transplanted organ may alter the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic profiles of these drugs with consequences for the medical management of the organ recipient. In addition, these drugs could be toxic to the transplanted organ. Please discuss the importance, limitations, and feasibility of studies of such drugs in the pig model prior to transplanting the pig organ into humans. So I know we've touched on a little of this, but let's hear from our two discussants. Um, first, uh, Dr. Auchincloss, and then uh, Dr. Kimmel, please. 
Well, question number six, I think, has been answered by Jay Fishman already. Uh, I don't think there's any predicting this, what's going to happen to drug metabolism before we actually do the clinical transplant, since we'll have a, one organ from a pig and a, another organ, say, the liver from the human recipient. So I don't think there's any predicting. But this is what we do all the time in transplantation, is to measure drug levels, measure drug effect, and adjust accordingly. In that sense, we've been asked to address a bunch of really important questions during the course of the two days. Question number six, I think, is the least important of the ones that we have to address. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Kimmel. All right, um, you know, as Dr. Polevsky said, we have to do lots of studies in pig physiology and we shouldn't let that uh, interfere. And this question is all about pig physiology. Uh, I'm also the last discussant, so uh, I'm working off the work of all the others and maybe there'll be some overlap in what I have to say. I think I'm gonna end up agreeing with Dr. Alkenkloss, but I go through this stuff that I've thought about. And I think the goal is to have a pathogen-free as possible porcine organ, which functions at an optimal level, capable of functioning for a long period. So in, fact, in effect, we'd like to know that the transplanted organ is normal and has no disease. And therefore, the evaluation of the animal donor for pathogen status and organ functional capacity and dysfunction is necessary. And Dr. Beeson's very short but comprehensive, thoughtful presentation um, actually changed some of my uh, ideas about uh, what, what we should do. I think we also should consider whether we need to have a whole new research program before we go ahead. I, th I think learning about the function of the porcine kidney before widespread use in transplantation in humans with ESRD will be critical. Uh, the model used is also important, and an analogy comes to mind, the use of the oncologic models of aged and sick animals, uh, as Ned Sharpless did, and those with comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes mellitus should be considered. So um, perhaps the best model is the aged sick pig. Um, animals treated with multiple medications would also be useful in estimating how a porcine kidney will function in the complex of environment of an aged host with renal disease and comorbid medical conditions treated for chronic illnesses with multiple medications. So it might be also useful to study porcine organs subjected to immunosuppressive therapies as suggested yesterday and as I guess suggested by Dr. Wu just a little while ago. The medical complications of kidney transplantation that are pertinent to porcine transplantation should also be considered. And in humans, those would include short-term complications of kidney transplant, including acute kidney injury, markedly reduced levels of GFR, glomerular filtration, and viral, fungal, protozoan, and bacterial diseases, which may complicate the short-term course. In addition, thought should be given to how a porcine kidney would function in the long-term course of kidney transplantation, including considerations of how chronic porcine kidney graft dysfunction will manifest itself in humans over longer periods where hyperfiltration may be an important but ever-present contributor to injury, and Dr. Polevsky touched on that. Uh, an interesting question by Dr. Beeston regarding the response to human parathyroid hormone could be studied in porcine isolated perfused kidney or isolated tubule perfusion experiments that would be in effect repeating the physiologic studies done in kidney disease in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but I think much of those studies, as a couple of people have mentioned, will have to be done in humans. A, a critical area of study is the treatment of serious viral infections in patients who have received transplants, how will the kidney respond and the heart respond to those treatments, and such studies should be performed in animal models if possible. Um, I would also argue, given the um, analogy of uh, working in aged sick models, that the best uh, porcine kidney should be studied in non-human primates with 
those kinds of comorbidities, aged, with diabetes, with hypertension. And, of course, that's a different um, research question. It's a different and difficult set of experiments. And Dr. Zeiss mentioned that that might be uh, some area to uh, look at. Um, but to my way of thinking, the ultimate tests in kidney transplantation in humans will need to be related to the experimental care of patients with end-stage kidney disease. And I'd argue this may be analogous to the early transplant studies done in the 1950s before the demonstration of feasibility by the Herrick twin transplantation and before modern immunosuppression, before and after the calcineurin inhibition era. So transplantation kidney disease done at the Brigham before 1955 was really quite the Wild West. And there are other analogies, starting with Christian Barnard for heart transplantation. Translation to humans will require scrupulous attention to provision of information during the informed consent process. It will be important also to avoid at all costs therapeutic misconceptions of patients receiving pioneering therapies. So I think I agree with several of the previous speakers that key clinical questions can only be answered in the human transplantation model. For instance, will porcine kidney transplants undergo unwanted hypertrophy? How will the porcine kidney interact in the human recipient and pathways related to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, 125-hydroxy vitamin D production, and erythropoietin synthesis in action, for example? Uh, and Dr. Buston also mentioned coagulation uh, differences, which could become important. Um, we have therapeutic choices to address most of these issues in patients, uh, and I think we're going to have to confront them in the human model. Uh, we'd also like to know how the xenotransplant functions and be cared for in the recipient if that recipient has overwhelming viral infection or septic shock, so we would have to investigate the result of relatively nephrotoxic drugs in that situation in patients. Um, this was touched on also earlier today. Will genetic modifications of the porcine kidneys endure, and will the genetic modifications of the porcine kidney affect other organ function in the human host that can only be tested in human beings? Um, and I think we have to consider the role of the complement system uh, which has been considered in the pig, but evaluation of the complement system in interaction with the porcine transplant will be critical in assessing short and long-term human recipient kidney function. The intensity of monitoring of the patient who recently underwent porcine heart transplantation reported in the New England Journal points to the unknown nature of multi-system complications in the first patients to be xenotransplanted the need for many and perhaps unanticipated short- and long-term laboratory tests in patients, and the seemingly unlimited biologic pathways which require evaluation in the first group of pioneering heroic patients. So I think key elements going forward will be the willingness of informed patients as participants in important medical experiments to undergo experimental procedures, having received informed consent in the most scrupulous fashion, where the safety of the recipient is maximized in a relatively unknown clinical situation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kimmel. Um, let's, uh, let's first hear now from uh, Mr. Conway. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Kimmel for his comments. And as always, he strikes the balance of uh, principle and idealism and ethics. And I think that's central to this. My sense on questions five and six is that um, we are now at a point at a two-day meeting where uh, we have a collection of known uh, unknowns. And I don't say that to be funny. I actually say that to be quite accurate because it seems like we keep adding to the list of the unknown. But the general consensus is around those things that need to be checked. And the number of times that we have said uh, moving to uh, human trials is very important. I think Dr. Cooper hit this. I think Dr. Fishman has hit this, and Dr. Bloom and others have contributed to it. Uh, as an aside, I would say to Dr. Oshenklaus that most kidney patients have a cardiologist, and we're happy to broker between the two professions. Um, we used to doing that many times. Um, but I will say that uh, we're at a crossroads, 
And I think much of this is dependent upon the idealism and motivation of those patients who will be willing to pioneer this. I think it's very, very important, the role of FDA, in assuring safety and to make certain that things are not misstated in these early stages as we move forward in terms of what it means for patients, what patients might derive from it in terms of the benefit, but to understand this is pioneering and it's a new chapter in history. But we've been here before. We've been here before with transplantation. We've been here before with dialysis. We've been here before with HIV. And we've been here before with COVID. But what has made the distinction positive and negative in each of those episodes has been this, has been the inclusion of patients. And I think we're at the point now where you have a much more organized and much more vocal uh, kidney patient population and transplant patient population around the world that are patient consumers that want to be involved, that want to take the next step. And we're partners in science. We're no longer the folks just on the other side of the table. We are partners in the endeavor because our lives will the outcome. So pass or fail, we have a direct stake in it. And I just want to put that on the table here because I think it's very, very important as we take a look at these questions and the answers that have been developed and the consensus um, in, the, in the sense of the conversations that I put a field that you put together so accurately, uh, that really the role of the patient in the need for science to move forward is critical. And I just want to put that out right here quite plainly, that you have patients around the world who are ready to participate. In fact, two years ago, patients began organizing the first international consortium that is patient-led for the development of artificial implantable wearable and veno transplants. The demand for this on the consumer side is coming from the patient, and we're the ones that are behind the effort to develop an international consortium. So that is to give my fellow professionals uh, inspiration and hope and for the scientists to know that uh, patients are right next to them. In fact, we're already organizing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Conway. All right, so now we have an opportunity uh, for the other members of the committee uh, to weigh in um, really on, on uh, both questions five and six, and, and I'll remind you five um, about existing data on uh, target pig organ um, function to support full organ function in humans, aging of the target organ um, in the pig relevant to expected organ function over time in humans, and then uh, this question six about um, uh, drugs, uh, um, underlying conditions, immune suppressants, um, and the importance, limitations, and feasibility of studies of these drugs uh, in pig models um, before transplant into humans. So watching for hands from uh, the other committee members who would like to uh, raise additional points um, for discussion um, on these questions. Um, great. Uh, Dr. Bloom, please, uh, and then Dr. Fishman. Uh, I'd just like to jump the shark and say uh, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Conway and Dr. Kimmel's uh, remarks. And I don't think anyone could have summarized uh, uh, better than Dr. Kimmel. I, and I, I think uh, I would certainly endorse his comments, as well as Mr. Conway's. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Fishman. Yeah, you know, I've been an advocate, of course, of going into clinical trials. But there are some things that we can study and should be studied in either the primate models or in pigs themselves. And one of those um, is a way of enhancing safety, and I mentioned it yesterday, I think, which is to use the clinically relevant immune suppression in the pigs with level monitoring and metabolic monitoring to see if infections are elicited that uh, we didn't detect by routine testing and so that it might be a way of, of giving us a sense of, since we have herds of animals, then immunosuppressing um, selected members of those herds might be informative both about toxicities of the drugs but also about side effects and relative to both metabolic and infectious side effects that might be useful for going forward into clinical trials. 
Great, thank you. Thanks. So let's hear from Professor Fox, please. Yeah, I, I also really appreciated many of the uh, the reviews, um, and most notably, I think Dr. Kimball's and, and and Mr. Conway's comments. So thank you. Um, I guess my my biggest concern about the current status is is this this whole growth of the organ once it's transplanted. I think there were many other points that were brought up. I, I think um, uh, the, the comment about potential immunity that Dr. Pawlewski brought up about uh, you know potentially attacking erythropoietin and, and, and an autoimmune reaction that would uh, potentially lead to uh, a placia. But 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 I just really think the only way you're going to figure out a lot of this is going to be do small pilot studies, those early phase one studies, and do some limited number of patients to see what, what happens. So I, I think one of the last comments that I heard from Dr. Kimball, if I got it right, was before you started, you know, widespread studies, I, I would see that this is the FDA moving forward potentially with, with, with small pilot studies with these different knockouts. And I guess from the growth side, the idea of having the growth hormone knocked out is, is going to be, may become a very relevant one. Um, but overall, I think I, I, do, I do agree with, with uh, Dr. Kimmel's uh, final summary that seemed very, very much on target with, with things I've been thinking about. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not seeing other hands up. Um, I can do a, a little summarizing, see where we're at, and then um, um, so why don't I do that uh, after we hear from um, um, our, um, uh, our consumer representative, um, Ms. O'Sullivan Horton, um, then I'll summarize and then we'll have time for additional comments and checking in uh, with the agency about our discussion to date. Thanks. I just wanted to say um, this afternoon has been fascinating and more along the lines of what Mr. Conway suggested. I wonder if as we, as we move forward with these um, you know, these to answer, tie up some of, cross these T's, dot these I's on the things that we can move forward with scientifically and outside of transplant into humans, um, that perhaps the, the FDA's mechanism for a, a PFDD or similar meeting might be um, appropriate in terms of really getting the opinions of the transplant community, kidney, heart, et cetera, um, to make sure that not only to educate patients on where we are in the process, but also to elicit their um, feedback and really make sure that we are, that we understand the risk benefit analysis that they would accept. Because my guess is that um, if I was a, a waiting transplant and had been doing so for years, that if I heard, you know these titans of science tell me that we're almost at the point where we can move, but it's going to, it's going to, you know, some of the burden is going to be risk to the patient that, um, you know, I think it would be wise to really have involve patients and have that two-way communication um, as we move forward. Great. Thank you for um, raising that important point for patient involvement and, and patient education. All right, so um, let me hit uh, some of the keynotes that I have heard uh, from our discussion this afternoon about questions five and six. Um, so in terms of the ability of uh, target pig organs to support full organ function, um, a lot of these things uh, are experiments that are uh, really to be determined. Um, and I think this also ties, uh, I think it all ties together with um, age of the organs and of uh, the drug metabolism in in, and in terms of the treatments of the patients, that um, the experiments we do are going to involve a situation of um, porcine organs in a human and that the porcine organ will vary as the genetic engineering of that donor animal vary um, in those settings and of the target organ that is transplanted. So it, uh, it is highly complex. We don't have a lot of data yet. And while first pass functional tests of, um, uh, of oxygen exchange in lungs, of, um, of some of the uh, some of 
kidney functions would not then go down to the next step of some of the more subtle uh, enzymatic actions, the hormone secretion um, and ability to respond to uh, hormones, uh, erythropoietin, all of these things that are the next level of complexity down that are nonetheless going to be critical for the um, long-term function of that organ in humans that we just do not yet um, have uh, data from, from those studies. So what, um, what can we do um, now? Um, there are some additional data on drug metabolism, hormone metabolism, receptors and protein interactions that could be done um, only in pig organs. That, um, that could be done now. Um, we can uh, perhaps upgrade those models to include uh, aged and uh, sick animals that more closely model the uh, older and, uh, and some of the health issues facing the uh, human patient recipients of those organs. Uh, much has been done in the cancer world that you get very different answers when you look and ask questions in an older um, animal who's had cancer for a while as opposed to a young animal that got cancer three days ago. Um, a suggestion that um, immune suppression could be tested uh, in those animals um, to to learn more about what will be um, what those organs will necessarily be exposed to uh, after transplantation to human patients. Um, uh, aged six non-human non primates uh, would also uh, should be considered. So there are ways to do in vitro studies now. There are ways to do model studies now. Um, but I think the the punchline that a lot of uh, the folks around the table have brought up um, is that there are questions that can only be answered um, uh, in transplanted organs um, received by human patients. But that all being said, and that being something of an unknown, um, the point has also been raised that in the allotransplant world, um, and indeed even in normal uh, uh, drug delivery to human patients, drugs are titrated, and that's uh, completely normal with protocols, and so we have the ability um, in patients in real time to titrate um, these drugs according to their individual SIP levels in their uh, livers and other organs, as well as um, in, a, in a transplant setting for immune suppression um, and, um, and the other uh, therapeutic drugs. So those are um, are some of the things that I heard around the table. So I'm going to watch for hands from the committee if anyone would like to um, add or, or modify anything I summarized. Um, and then um, I would also open it to um, uh, Dr. Bryan or others from the agency to see if, um, uh, if there are uh, other things that they would like the committee to address uh, to get to the heart of these questions that we haven't already touched on. All right, Dr. Beeston. Thank you for the conversation. So I have two broad topics. So first I'd want to thank Dr. Fishman because he first started, well, we don't need studies because we already have paradigms for titration, but then he recognized that maybe we can learn something from doing these studies in the pigs and, and, and figure out what the dose would be and maybe some toxicities. So I just wanted to go back to Dr. Fishman a little bit and say, do you have a short list of drugs where you think it might be worth it to find out what the toxicity of the pig is, especially like nephrotoxicity or cardiac toxicity, where it could be looked in the pig and make sure that that toxicity would not necessitate figuring out a different drug that may be more appropriate because that toxicity would be the human dose that we would need to achieve the other effects that we're looking for? Okay, and I'll ask Dr. Fishman uh, if he can please respond. So I'm going to go back to um, your own comments, which is that we may not be able to get all organs from each animal. Um, and the reason it's relevant, I think, is because we would say, I want to transplant organ X, a heart or kidney, uh, from this pig, and then subject them to the clinical um, immunosuppression, at least, that and other drugs potentially that they get routinely, but the immunosuppression would be the focus 
in terms of toxicity. And we know what the toxicities of those drugs are in humans. Uh, as you pointed out, we don't necessarily know what the toxicity of those drugs are, although we've learned a lot from the preclinical studies in primates. So we do know that a lot of these organs have been ex exposed to clinically relevant immune suppression. But I think it's a way of learning both about the toxicity of the drug, the metabolism of the drug by that organ. So if you're doing, for example, liver transplantation, and then the side effects of those drugs uh, in terms of infectious activation. Um, I think that there are more data than what we might imagine because of all the numbers of laboratories that have been using different immunosuppressive regimens with different genetic types of pigs. Uh, so those data could be collected and may exist already. Um, but I think your question is a great one. Uh, I think it's a question of assembling those data uh, from models that exist, and then perhaps uh, doing some additional studies to be sure when you pick your immunosuppressive regimen that's matched to your genetic type, uh, are there unanticipated side effects? So, sure. Thank you for that. And then I wanted to follow up to the interesting discussion of the pig heart size. So, one of the last comments was that the adult uh, pig heart size was achieved in the baboon model and that everything, you know, was fine, it stopped growing. But when you look at Dr. Fox's talk, he has this very interesting slide where it shows the pig growth and then the um, baboon growth and the, I think it's, yeah, baboon. Um, and the baboon is only getting up to about 25 kilograms, where the, the pig is 100 kilograms, where you get to the, sort of the best fit size for um, outcomes for, for the baboon. Well, humans are much larger than that. So can we, you know, have a discussion, maybe not now, but as people start thinking about this, about what the criterion would be for figuring out the uh, size of a heart that you would need for transplant. And then the other thing I want to point out part, as part of this is the Growth hormone knockout only goes so far because while that growth hormone knockout may be great in the pig for preventing growth, the human recipient will have growth hormone, and that growth hormone will go to the liver, which will make IGF-1, and IGF-1 is another growth factor. So do we understand enough about the organs where we are we're trying to transplant them and what the contribution of IGF-1 is to the ultimate size that would be obtained? All right. Um, I'm going to look for uh, hands um, for anyone who would like to uh, uh, well, Dr. Beeston said we, you know, we need perhaps more discussion uh, than we have time for today. Is there um, someone who would like to weigh in uh, on this uh, for us now? Watching for those hands. Okay, perhaps this is uh, this is indeed something for um, for more discussion uh, uh, at a later time for more specific answers uh, to your questions, Dr. Beeston. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, so, um, other um, other topics, other comments before we um, uh, yes, uh, Judy. Um, yes, if, if I may go back to a question um, related to our discussions yesterday, and um, that is we'd like to know how the community feels about um, archiving and collecting samples for um, xeno products that have been exposed to well-characterized antibodies. And just as a reminder, that, that's the lowest level of risk. So these are cell lines that are well established, they've been tested, and so um, I just wanted to get clarification or some input on what the committee thinks as a whole about reducing the requirements for those products. Thank you. 
All right. Um, I'm going to watch for a show of hands on on uh, anyone who would like to weigh in on that uh, lowest bar. Um, I I think um, you know from what we said yesterday that um, we we talked about uh, sort of case by case and people presenting their uh, their best data um, in their package. But um, let's uh, first hear from Dr. Morrison and then Dr. Bloom. Can't hear you, Dr. Morrison. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm just saying that uh, I think it's very reasonable to lower the requirements when all that's happening is that the human the the human cells are being exposed to a well characterized cell line and culture. It's a much less complica complex situation than actually transplanting an organ from a donor animal. Um, and if the cell line is well characterized, um, I th I think it's a reasonable thing to do. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Bloom? Uh, oh, I would agree with Sean, and I would note that, um, that the lack of any discussion on that topic uh, really indicates that uh, the, the uh, I think, indicates that the other committee members would agree, and I think Sean said it very well. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Professor Fox, and then um, I'll have a couple last comments, and we'll go to Dr. Marks. Professor Fox. I just wanted to support what Dr. Bloom said, right? That I, I also agree. I think the risk is very well, so I didn't want him to be out on a whim. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so I appreciate um, <clears throat> the folks from the agency asking some additional questions, and I also wanted to express my thanks um, for the additional comments about uh, that the uh, patients uh, are the partners of the clinicians and, and researchers doing this work, and that uh, additional outreach and, and education uh, would be appreciated to, you know, to further uh, garner the education and support um, of the patients and patient advocates. Uh, so with that, um, I think we've had some terrific discussion, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Marks, uh, the director of CBER. So, Dr. Butterfield, thanks, thanks very much. I really appreciate um, the committee's thoughtful discussion. I wish I could have been for all of it. I've been in and out of, of listening to it over the past two days. Um, really appreciate the thoughtful discussion in this area. There's tremendous interest, tremendous promise, and tremendous challenges as you uh, uh, talked about. Um, but um, really, this is such an important, uh, such important input to get here, and we really appreciate uh, the incredible, thoughtful information uh, and discussion that's uh, occurred. So thank you all so much, and uh, really wish you a very pleasant holiday weekend. Thank you again for uh, uh, the time today, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Marks. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the meeting over to our DFO, Christina Burt. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. Christina, is Dr. Wilson going to make some comments? Sure. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Bryant. No, I just wanted to echo uh, Dr. Marks. Uh, uh, thank uh, the committee. It's been so helpful to us, and we really are very enthusiastic about the field of xenotransplantation and uh, look forward to uh, ongoing discussions in this area. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Okay, with that, with those comments, I, I also would like to second uh, thank all the participants for today, and I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting today at 3.43 uh, p.m. Thank you. All right, thank you all. And with that studio, please take us, uh, please end the session. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to FDAOMA at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you so much. <laughs>